came straight out and that's as ready as it gets. Welcome folks, my name is Josh Wolf. I'm a developer advocate at Comunda. And today I'm gonna to be hacking on the ZB job worker clients with Falco, who is uh, one of our consultants at Comunda based in Berlin, Germany. It's like 4.10 in the afternoon here in New Zealand. And I guess it's like about seven or eight in Berlin. Let me double check that because I told everyone we'd do this at eight. So first of all, I want to acknowledge that we're kicking this thing off about 10 minutes late. Uh, Berlin. No, it's six o'clock in the morning. Okay. He was really, so yeah, Falco, uh, he said it was a little bit ambitious that that starting time. So he's going to take a couple of minutes to get here, but that's cool. We can just kind of hang out in the meantime. So how are you? Good to know. So we're going to be uh, looking at ZB client performance. So ZB is a distributed system. It's a workflow engine for orchestrating microservices. And it's built cloud first as a distributed system so that it can scale, it can replicate, it's fault tolerant, it's got resilience <clears throat> baked into the architecture. One of the things that Falco and I have discovered um, through using this ourselves, through interacting with users and customers, is that as a distributed system, performance lies everywhere and nowhere in the system. So you really, you can optimize one particular point of the system, but you can overload the system by having another point in the system that's not optimized. For example, um, if, you, if you think to yourself, if I put tons of workers in the system, that'll make it go faster, that can actually slow it down because the workers will be constantly asking for work from the broker and then the broker spends a lot of its time managing those requests from the workers and not as much time, you know, not as many CPU cycles are then available for it to process the actual work itself. So matching impedance, you know, in a distributed system, if you think of it like a, like the, the water main system of a city, you've got water flying through all these pipes and at the end they come out of a tap. But at any point in that system, if you have too much water flowing through, the pressure is too high, it's going to cause a problem. So we've been investigating, um, last week we investigated the, the ZB Java client to see exactly how it's implemented internally, to see what kind of optimizations are possible or would be useful, what kind of performance parameters, what happens if I add a thousand threads to one worker? What happens if I add a thousand workers with one thread? What are the implications of that? And then how does that change depending on the workload uh, that's currently on the broker? So there are some configurations that will work really well for high loads, um, but they'll be less efficient if you have a lower load. So it really depend it depends. It's what happens when you do uh, an investigation with a consultant, you arrive at the conclusion, it depends. So we looked at some parameters inside there and some that are not exposed that could be useful if we were to expose them. And I'm the maintainer and uh, architect of the node client for ZB. So I've been taking notes on paper, old school, with my uh, Commander pen this way. Uh, can I get it so you can see it? It's got Commando on there. I got that from the, the office in Berlin when I was there in September, a couple of years ago now. And uh, <clears throat> maybe that was last year. Anyway, uh, I've been taking notes that I'm going to be applying to the design of the node client to make it more efficient and performant in a wider variety of scenarios. I wonder if I get Twitch um, comments on here. Might actually open Twitch now just to see if this is actually streaming. Looks like it is. Watch now. Yes. Can I see myself? Yes, it's going. It's going well. Good. Very good. Let me go back here to StreamYard. I'm using StreamYard to stream this. So sort I'd of mute my mic there while I was clearing my throat. Uh, yeah, I'm using StreamYard to stream this. 
And the last time that Falco and I streamed our investigation, we did two hours of like high quality deep diving into the ZB Java client. And I forgot to press the go live button. Amateur mistake. First time for me streaming into Twitch using the StreamYard client. StreamYard.com, it's free. You can, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I didn't mute that time. Uh, yeah, you can stream into um, Twitch, Facebook, YouTube. You can even do like a custom RMTP, RTMP, RTMP, I think. Um, stream into restream.io, which can then split your stream into multiple destinations. But for that, you need to go onto the paid plan, which is $25 a month. I'm just using the free plan at the moment. One thing about StreamYard that would make it even better is if I could actually constrain my camera. Like at the moment, you know, you get to see the white wall over here and, um, you know, the microphone boom. And I would like to just like tighten it onto my head only. So I used a virtual camera with Ecamm Live, but the CPU usage goes up so high that it, uh, it doesn't work very well. Well, hey, he's not here, so I might just try it before he arrives. Let's try it out. I'll turn on Ecamm and then switch on the virtual camera. Ecamm Live. Okay, a new version is available. Would you like to download it now? Why not install update? Uh, camera mic. Yeah. See, now Ecamm has taken control of my camera. Let's go to the virtual camera. <clears throat> Stall and relaunch. Okay. So you probably got a frozen view of me midway through closing my eyes. Okay, Ecamm Live is back. Update the Stream Deck plugin, sure, why not? Um, now, camera. Uh, recording output, virtual cam, on. Okay, so yeah, install this thing. Yeah, install the profiles. Now, if I now go cam mic, switch my camera to the virtual cam, and then this is something that I discovered in StreamYard is when the camera freezes, you've got to turn the green screen off and then turn it back on. A well-lit green screen or blue screen is required. Oh, look at that. Tight. Way better. No white wall. It's all me. Would be kind of cool if I was halfway. Oh, i got to go this way, like this. There we go. I'm sort of directly underneath the rainbow now. I think that looks better. Although, when I'm here, you don't see the, uh, the mountain. That kind of looks symmetrical. But then with respect to the rainbow, that looks symmetrical. I'm going to go with that. I think that looks good. So let's see how it performs this time round. I've got two monitors that I'm running. So I think running, running two monitors and running Ecamm and running StreamYard. It's a big ask. Looking good though, I'm liking it. Let me just check on how far off Falco is. Any ETA. Um, I actually have to open some, some bugs. Let me move this over here. some features for the node client. So I might just do that while we're waiting. So I think I can go share screen. Let's see what this does. Screen sharing is easiest with two monitors. It works best on a good computer. I've got a pretty good computer. Some screens let you share audio. Okay. Share the screen. Um, share this one. Chrome tab. Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, anyway, I'll just share the entire screen. Should be okay. Share. And it should go into like an infinite regression because I'm sharing the screen with StreamYard in it. 
What happens if I hit play? Yes. Boom. All right. Okay, so if I go to GitHub and I'm going to go to the ZBIO organization and it's ZB client, I think. There it is. No JS. So one thing I discovered is I built some automation for Hacktoberfest so that incoming PRs will trigger a um, workflow. But one thing about it is that incoming pull requests, oh, there is an incoming pull request. Who's that from? Is that from me? Could be. Incoming pull requests that are coming from outside of your repository. So they're coming from another repo. Let me pull the StreamYard one onto my other monitor. Oh. Drag. Grab and drag. Put it over here. This is my control panel monitor then. Good. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, open by me. So if someone opens a pull request in your repository from their fork, it'll trigger the automation, but the workflow in the GitHub Actions doesn't get access to the secrets from your repo, which is a good idea. <clears throat> Otherwise, you know, they could modify the workflow and then use the secrets to do something else. But what that leads to is there's a failure in the test against Commander Cloud when that happens. What's happening here? Yeah, okay, that's good. Adaptive back pressure. So this is the one that um, that came out of the work that we did on the Java client. I want to put machine learning into this client so it figures out what's happening. So this is a chore, and it is uh, disable under cloud test on PR from fork. Okay. Uh, write a nice uh, summary here because my future self will thank me for it later. <laughs> okay, come on now. No, go away. Don't want that. Expected behavior, when a PR is opened from an external fork, okay? external fork, under cloud, automated test uh, does not run. behavior under cloud test runs on every pull request and fails due to missing secrets and run context other than, <clears throat> is it going to catch up? Like, what's happening? Hello? Where's the typing? Okay. Context. Other than uh, base repo. Possible solution um, in the GitHub workflow. That condition. So we're we're waiting for Falco to arrive. Need for eat. G'day. Waiting for Falco to uh, warm up this morning. It's uh, coming up to six thirty a.m. in Berlin. So he's joining early in his morning add a condition yeah that'll do that's enough for me to figure it out assign yourself that's me 
182. And, oh, look. No, that's the garage benchmark. Here's the client here. Okay. Hmm. This is a dirty branch. But here is the test that runs. Can take this out. We don't need that. Yeah, so here it is here. It runs on pull request. So I actually wrote an article about this on dev.to. Still on Hellmac. You better believe it. Yeah. Still rocking the Hellmac. If you look very carefully up here in the top right hand corner, oh, it's behind the stream powered by StreamYard um, icon. It actually has a little Hellmac symbol. I had to get a I had to create a custom keyboard layout for Mac OS to get that to work. Okay, let's have a look and see if my Still on Hellmac, yeah. I've completely lost my ability to type on QWERTY now, but Hellmac is native for me. Here it is here. A concierge workflow. Project with instructions on GitHub. Let's have a look in here. The workflows. Come on. Um, now, what do we got? Open PR. Okay. Um, test. Okay. Here we go. Uh, so there is one way that I could do it, <clears throat> and that is that, well, first of all, let me just block it so that it doesn't happen. Oh, it's right here. It's already in there. So I just say if it's running in the root repository, the only time we'll run this. That should do it. Test on Commander Cloud, PRs, main branch changes. Mm. What this means is that when someone submits a PR, it's not going to get tested against Commander Cloud. Let's have a look at NPM Publish. Yeah, it runs against Commander Cloud. Okay, so it'll get blocked at the point of publish if it doesn't work with the Commander Cloud. So if they if if someone submits a PR that passes the integration tests with the you know, the locally available broker, but then somehow fails against Commander Cloud, it won't get automatically tested in the PR itself. But when I merge it into master, and push, it'll get tested then. Yes. I wonder if this pull request runs on merge no, it runs on closed. Do not run on private base repositories. When you open a pull request from a forked repository. It's not a private base repository. When you create a pull request from a forked repository to the base repository, GitHub sends the pull request event to the base repository. And no pull request events occur 
on the fork repository. Okay, cool. Hang on a second. When you create a pull request from a fork repository to the base repository, GitHub sends the pull request event to the base repository. Hmm. Let me double check this because let's have a look. So it's access to GitHub actions, secrets, pull request. I'm pretty sure that it doesn't run, you know, because someone could make a pull request that modifies the um, workflow itself to, I don't know, post all of the secrets to a REST endpoint. which could be a problem. So I think they disabled it for that reason. GitHub Actions improvements for fork and pull request workflows. New setting for private repositories. No, improvements for public repository forks. That's the one we're looking at. GitHub Actions have always been about more than just continuous integration. Our goal is to enable repository maintainers to automate Ta -ta, reduce manual effort. Yep. Here we go. In order to protect public repositories for, from malicious users, I think there should be, we run all pull request workflows raised from repository forks with a read only token and no access to secrets. Okay. However, instead of running against the workflow, and code from the merge commit. The event runs against the workflow and code from the base of the pull request. Okay, so it looks as though this is not going to work because it's going to be running in this. Let's let's have a look at the pull pull request event. Um, let's have a look. GitHub Actions. pull requests. Nope. Um, I'm looking for the pull request object. Interactions? No. Guides? Get the latest version. Let's have a look. Okay, so um, guides, da, 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 traversing, no reference maybe. It's kind of where I would expect it to be. Actions, activities, apps, billing. Pull. Pull request, here we go. Okay, what about the pull request event? Mm. Let's try searching it. Um, so GitHub action pull request event. GitHub action pull request event. 
events that trigger workflows, webhook event payloads. Let's try that. That looks like it. Dun dun. Okay, pull request. So what I'll be looking for is the, um, here we go, pull request. Okay, can be any of these, action, yeah, number, changes, 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 pull request, repository. The repository where the event occurred. Previous version. Doesn't tell me where it's coming from. Okay, it's a big object. It's got a lot of stuff in it. Good. Pull request, URL. Okay, that's going to be this repo. At the moment, we're comparing github.repository. Mm. So we would be, okay, repo, base, So you got pull request repo and base repo. So the base repo would be this one, github.repository. That's a different object to this one. No, here, github.repository, but no, it's comparing a string. So it's definitely not this object that it's looking at there. Okay, so um, GitHub action, GitHub object, context, sort of context. Looks like this is turned into a um, GitHub actions. Falco says he'll be here in uh, like five minutes. Okay, context and expression syntax. Hacktoberfest, yeah, setting up something for Hacktoberfest. So it's at, um, you get a f so you get a free t-shirt for doing four pull requests in October in Hacktoberfest. And if you do just two of those to Komunda, you can get um, a free t-shirt. So a free t-shirt for two pull requests. I mean, if you did four pull requests to Komunda or ZB repos, you could get three T-shirts. You could get two T-shirts from Komunda and then a T-shirt from Hacktoberfest. That would be the bomb. There are probably others as well. If you can find another project that does two pull requests for a T-shirt in Hacktoberfest, you could get three T-shirts from different places. So if you go to komunda.com, Hacktoberfest 2020, all the details are there. There's even, uh, there are even issues in the node client that are tagged with Hacktoberfest. You could do anything in here, um, you know, that results in a, in a pull request. But you can see here, making retries configurable via environment variables, that's tagged Hacktoberfest. Change user agent to common format, that's tagged Hacktoberfest. So those ones are kind of ones that we went through and had a look. And, and in, in the various repos in ZBIO, you can find Hacktoberfest. There's actually a query, I think, in here. Um, we put a query together for it. ZB? Nope. Yeah, I made a query. Oh, here we go. Links to repos. Okay, that's interesting. Um, it's not there. But the way you can do it is you go to, let me show you how you do this. It'd be good to put the link in there, actually. CBIO. Let's 
So now you search inside the repo or inside the organization and you just go label Oberfest. Type issue, I think you might have to do that. Dun, dun, dun. Issues. So there are 52 issues that have been tagged with Hacktoberfest across the different um, projects. Same thing for Komunda. You can run the same query in Komunda or in BPMIO to get a list of Hacktoberfest friendly um, ZB t-shirts. We might be able to arrange that actually. We might be able to arrange that ZB t-shirt. Could do it like this. You could do four pull requests to ZB projects and get a Hacktoberfest Commander t-shirt and a ZB t-shirt and a Hacktoberfest t-shirt. Then you've got like a full wardrobe, you know? You just rotate those every day. Boom. So yeah, there's this limited edition Commander Hacktoberfest 2020 t-shirt. So that's kind of cool because it's like a dated, you know, limited edition thing. Like it's like a you had to be there. ZB t-shirt you could get at any stage by doing a, a contribution to the ZB project. Uh, but this Hacktoberfest one is just for that one month. Oh, yeah, you get some stickers as well. That's pretty cool. You can stick them on your laptop. So that's the kind of uh, query that you need to run to get that. Okay, but back to this uh, GitHub repository context thing. I digress. A good digression, but a digression nonetheless. Contexts. So if we have a look in contexts, Here's the GitHub object that comes in, secret strategy matrix needs, runner, steps, job, end. So it must be this GitHub context. Okay, GitHub event, the full event webhook payload. Yeah, okay. Repository. Base ref. Target branch, head ref, source branch. Okay. Mm-hmm. GitHub.repository. So, okay, I think that what we need to do is GitHub.event. Like this. GitHub.event. Go back to our web hook event payload. Mm -mm. So it's incoming from is repository, and then there is oh you got base, and then you got a head. So head repo full name like this. Mm -mm -mm. That. Um, let me just double check, head, repo, full name, okay, head, pull request, like that, the only problem is that this also runs on a push, but it runs on a pull request. Hmm. So that GitHub event pull request head repo full name, it would probably throw an exception if it was triggered from a push. So I'd kind of need to split this into two in that case. One for pull requests, internal pull requests, and one for push. Uh, copy. So this would be test internal pull request. Yeah, on on command cloud, and then we would get rid of push. So it only runs on a pull request. 
actually, nah, because then I'm going to duplicate the code, which is like really dumb. For maintenance work. I could probably do it like this if you can use and if um, predicate. Mm -mm -mm. Operators. Okay. Loose equality. Oh, hang on. Does it do $6 million question? Does it do shortcut evaluation, short circuit? I'm going to say that it does. So if uh, GitHub dot event, this is how I check what triggered it. Let's have a look. Context, the GitHub context, event, full payload. Um, okay. Operators. Functions. Contains, starts with, okay, these are strings, format. What about checking for an object? The other thing that's kind of challenging about this is there's no local test for this thing. You have to actually push it and run it to see if it actually works. Oh, here's Falco. Pull him in. Add stream. And let's go with uh, this one. Add to stream. Hey, good morning. Gordon, welcome, mine here. Good morning. Well, good, thank you. I didn't realize how early it was. I was like, oh, it's 8 a.m. in Berlin. It's 6 a.m. in Berlin. Yeah, it was a bit, a little bit ambitious to get up that early, but <laughs> crazy, crazy. As as I see, you already got started with something. Ah, oh, yeah, I got uh, sidetracked into um, GitHub Actions and uh, automated testing on Commander Cloud, and then talking with uh, Need for Eat about Hacktoberfest. He's keen to get a ZB T-shirt. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's gonna come up. So, yeah, it's only like nine days away, or eight days away. Uh, stop sharing my screen. I'll turn that off. Is that gonna make my thing go a little bit faster? Yeah, maybe finish what you were doing. Not that we have like a hard cut here. Uh, I don't know how well my machine's going to cope with um, streaming the camera and the screen and you at the same time. Let's try clicking this. Uh, uh, uh. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, it looks good. Okay, let's try it. Let's see if it does it. Okay, I'm going to share the screen again. Hang on. I can see you, but you look like you're frozen. No, you're just like very still. <laughs> yeah, just looking at the video stream. Share screen. Let's try it again. Um, yeah, so what I was doing is um, I have this automated test here that runs in. Let's have a look. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. So this automated test runs on Commander Cloud. And it runs every time code gets pushed, but it also runs on a pull request coming in from an external fork. But the issue is that when this automation gets run in GitHub Actions on a pull request from an external fork, it doesn't have access to the secrets to connect to come onto cloud. Because, of course, you know, your attack vector would be you submit a pull request to the repo, and what you've done is you've modified this automation to post the secrets to a REST endpoint somewhere, right? <laughs> so they don't allow that to happen, which means that it fails every time. 
So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get it to not run this automation if the pull request is coming from an external fork. So where I got to here is like going through the documentation and you can get metadata about, you know, the context of this execution. And I'm just comparing the, um, the GitHub repository with the pull request head repo. So that's pretty much where I got to. And then I wanted to make sure that this doesn't fail. So I got to do something that's like is not null. <laughs> so you only want to uh, run it on pull requests that are coming from maintainers of the project. Yes. And also I've, I've kind of, it's overloaded. So I'm using it whenever there's a push as well, which is why I need to do this is not null check kind of thing here. Mm. And it looks like they have some functions that can do that. Uh, objects are not converted to a string. Yeah, no, it doesn't look like I can. Anyway, I can look into that uh, a bit later. And if I forget where I was up to, I can come back and watch the video. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> exactly. That's the great thing about streaming the work that you're doing. You can come back and watch it later. What was I doing? Let me check the archive. So, so it fixes that problem that half a year later, you look at your own code and you don't know what, we, what you were doing. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And then even... I've used it, um, I fixed uh, an issue for a user and then, you know, they were having trouble understanding how it actually works internally. And I was like, let me help you out here. <laughs> Let's do an hour of sitting together coding on this thing via this link to the archives. Mm -hmm. But should we have a look at what do, you, what do you want to look at today? I mean, that yeah, stuff we did the other day was amazing but it didn't make it to the internet it streamed into dev null. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, then let me get set up here. In fact, I looked a little bit into it more on Friday night. So uh, it's kind of good that we can review this with a, with a more fresh eye now. Uh, you might have seen the um, bulk of Slack messages over the weekend on my discoveries, but yes, well, let's share this. Hey, um, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. How do I pronounce your last name? So the official pronunciation of my name is Falco Menge. Menge, Menge? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is like a very soft G sound. It's almost unhearable there. Menge. Mm -hmm. And then the last, E is pronounced like an A, A? Uh? No, it's just, um, I guess in German we have a, like a funny way to end that, like Menge. It's not, it's not an A, it's more like an E that's a little bit uh, ended. Menge. Okay. But I hear that, that many people try to pronounce it like an A or something. It's very yeah. subtleties. Okay, let me bring up my screen here and share my lovely Eclipse. Yes, lots of tips from. Stream up. All right, you should be seeing my screen, and I think Josh, you have to bring it on the. Oh yeah, right on. Stream. Um, add to stream. Oh, stop sharing my screen. Yeah. I think you already stopped your, sc your screen now. I did. Okay, great. So what do we want to look at? What is this mysterious thing that we did on Friday already and now we do it again? Um, so we want to look into um, ZB clients, in particular, how they are working on service tasks, right? So if you have a VPN process in ZB, then um, the, one of the most popular things to use are service tasks because that's the main way how 
um, your own code can integrate into the BPMN workflow. And yeah, for a service task, you need a so-called worker that is the ZB client in any programming language would connect to the broker and then um, request open jobs for particular topics. Yes. And, and my particular interest in looking at that was that when I designed the node client, I just thought faster is better. And so I designed the node client to be like as, as hyper efficient, hyper, hyper efficient with quotes as possible. And like requesting work is like as soon as it could do more work, but the result is that it hosed as the broker with uh, requests. It wasn't the smartest way to do it. Yeah, exactly. It's always about the balances. And part of what we're trying to do here is to understand the balances and what would be good configurations and what might be rather bad oper you know, con configurations. Yes. And maybe we can also try a little bit to see what could be better, what could be optimized for certain workloads. And uh, I'm certainly coming in here with a focus that is um, targeting low latency or low response times of the overall workflow. So mm. that means, um, you know, some customers might be interested in more um, um, the pure throughput of the system and not so much how fast stuff gets finished, especially if you, for example, have um, yeah more like offline processing that doesn't have to finish in real time, then that's totally fine. And ZB is doing really good in, in handling throughputs of, of also big sizes. Um, yeah, but sometimes we have customers that also have a desire that the workflow finishes within a very short time. And then obviously the workers are on the critical path of also um, yeah, finishing the jobs quick enough. And a lot of time that looks like, you know, um, triggering it through a REST request and then completing it before you send the response to the REST request. That's that's the pattern I've seen most often mm -hmm. that people are doing. Exactly. We have this feature that you can wait for the response of starting a workflow. And then, um, yeah, that's usually used when you are in a critical loop uh, with a client, with a mobile app, or yeah, just generally with a REST request that came in. And you want to reply to that within, well, sometimes sub-second response time, especially if a user is involved in that loop. All right. So, what are we staring at here on the screen? This is a um, this is the ZB getting started for Java using the Java client, and it's a fairly simple Java command line application. Um, it basically just gets started, builds a ZB client here. Obviously, needs the, the broker contact point and some config. Then uh, the first thing it does is de deploys a little process here. And once that is done, we're actually creating some payload and start a new workflow instance using the create instance command. In this case, we are not waiting for the result. We are just um, waiting for the completion of the start. Um, so that's done in one go. And then we come to the interesting part for today, which is the job worker. And the job worker is other command where we register for a certain job type. So each service task can define a job type. And this case is the payment service that we want to implement here. And yeah, then the typical pattern is that you can actually register a handler. Um, in this case, it's a Lambda function, which means uh, we will receive the job and the job client as an input to the Lambda then we can, for example, work with the variables, do some stuff, and then ultimately complete the job. And yeah, as I said, this, this is just a registration, right? So this Lambda is passed on as a handler into the job worker. Um, we also instruct this worker to fetch particular variables from ZB. This is pretty cool because then we don't have to transport all the variables all the time back and forth but we can just limit the traffic a little bit here. 
and that's that's going to be important uh, in the back end of CB because the you know usually when we go into the engine and ask for new jobs we don't ask uh, just for a single job like Josh did but we would actually want to have all the all the jobs or a larger chunk of jobs together and then um, limiting the amount of data that comes with each job also reduces the message size that um, of what we have to combine there. Yeah, and then finally, we have the open method, which kicks off um, uh, an endless loop of asking for more jobs and executing them. And then the rest is really just um, waiting until the, the application gets a closed signal. OK, <clears throat> so then. Yeah, maybe one important thing here to before we dive into the details of the worker, um, this Lambda looks a little bit like a synchronous implementation, right? So it, it, most of the examples look like this because then they, they are more having the mindset of you're doing something quick here on the, on the code side and you just block until you're done with that. <laughs> there could be some potential for improvement in doing this asynchronously. So depending on what you're doing in your in your job client, um, for example, if you do something like a long running rest call, it could actually make sense to do this in an asynchronous or reactive way here. So nobody forces you to synchronously write a code block that ends with the completion of a job. You could also just kick off a rest call and then <clears throat> and, you know, like use a right asynchronous pro programming framework that maybe either uses another thread or some other mechanics for handling this in a reactive way and then um, yeah whenever the response comes back to your rest call then you do the actual completion and that's probably Josh what you are doing in the uh, node.js client because there everything is done with callbacks and pretty much exactly yeah but I think we discovered that this actually runs in an asynchronous context by design already right so mm -hmm. Even if That's you wrote true. it synchronously, it wouldn't block the other workers like it would schedule other jobs on other threads, right? Yeah, that's true. And um, so this is running in a separate thread for sure. So it wouldn't block any other jobs from being executed unless we are fully maxed out with our thread pool capacity. And we will see some of, we'll see that actually the entire Java client is done in an, in an asynchronous way, like I described how, how this function could be as well. Um, just this piece itself is not done reactively. And yeah, I, rem I remember changed. when we first got onto this on Friday, I was like, well, why wouldn't you just wrap that whole executor in an asynchronous context? And then we went in and it was like, oh, they did. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, maybe let's look a little bit into the details of how a ZB is or how this client is implemented. And then just um, before we go there, I have a mm -hmm. question about this. Sure. Would it then be an over optimization or even detrimental to make this asynchronous in, inside the handler, given that it's already running on its own thread? Wouldn't you just exhaust threads like that doing that? Um now, yeah, there there is also um, a penalty of uh, context of having, switching of context switching with too many threads, right? So the more modern way to do it would be to really kick this off. Like, say you have a REST call that takes maybe a quarter of a second to return if it's some slow external system over the internet. Mm. Um, so then, you know, you, you just kick that off, send the request. While you're waiting, you park that in some kind of list or queue or something like that. And then basically, whenever the data comes back over the network, then you assign that that response to a thread to work on. But there's no need to have a thread that's blocking the entire time, meaning it needs to be really doing a context switch off the CPU. Another thread gets into the CPU. So that, that would be a little more efficient. And of course, it all depends what you are what you are bound in terms of performance, right? Um, so usually the worker wouldn't be so much CPU bound, 
So you could argue that having more threads shouldn't be too much of a hassle because we don't have anything else to do with a CPU. So we might as well just have that additional context switching overhead. Um, but, you know, it's a bit of an artificial limitation. In case you reach your, your threat limit, you stop doing things in parallel. So for example, by default, the ZB Java client is running with a single thread to execute the jobs. So if you don't oh, really? pay attention to that, you might uh, step on the brakes quite quite hard to start with. So if we look a little bit here into um, this is ZB client builder, um, just this beautiful piece that we used here at the beginning when we uh, built the ZB client, there we can see all the default values. So by default, we have um, yeah, a single thread that, that's being executed. Um, default mm. value is one. And that means actually that then every job is run one after the other. And yeah, on Friday night, I was wondering, because when I looked into this code a little bit more in detail, I saw that this is actually, um, let me see if I find this. Yeah, I kind of, yeah, it's it's basically using a scheduled thread pool in the backend. And for a scheduled uh, thread pool, uh, this thread count will actually mean a hard limit of the number of threads. On Friday night, I was a little bit confused because actually the, the standard thread pool executor would use this as a, as a, as a lower bound and not as an upper bound. So if you go inside here and then look at the, at this, this is like the core pool size, and then that goes down to the parent class. And then you would be tempted to think, hey, this is just the core pool size and the maximum pool size is unbounded. Um, you know, and I look back to the comments here and somewhere found the comment that this thing actually acts as a fixed size pool using core pool size. Um, so um, that's already quite deep now, but it's uh, an important implementation detail. So there's one scheduled executor here, which has the capability to schedule work at a given time. So that means you can use that for delaying work and scheduling later, which doesn't seem to make so much sense for the job execution itself. Because once you have a job in the worker, you would the hell not delay it, right? You would immediately want to execute it. Um, the, the thing is that we try to use the same thread pool executor for all the things we need to do in the client. And the other thing we need to do is the actual polling. That is something that we want to do with a certain interval. Or not, depending on how you want to look at it. <laughs> Okay, so if, if you left the thread pool at one and wrote all asynchronous code in the handler, you'd get something similar to the behavior of node. Uh, yeah, you could argue that, yeah. I think by default, if you do asynchronous work in Java, you would still have, um, you would, um, there's different ways. You have a default thread pool that all that the JVM spawns at the beginning, um, which can be used for all sorts of just not thinking about threading work. And well, in the ZB client, we somehow decided to uh, build our own thread pool executor, and it's a scheduled one, and it's limited to one for now. Seems like a good idea, because then you could write synchronous code and you can tune the performance by changing that value, right? Whereas if you write mm -hmm. asynchronous code, now you suddenly have no control over it. It depends on the amount of work that comes into it. Yeah. Well, the thing is that right now we don't expose this executor to the client here, right? So, or to the handler. So in my Lambda, the only thing I could do would be either to spawn an own thread pool if I wanted to, or probably more realistically, just spawn it off to the default thread pool of the JVM. So for example, 
Let me quickly drag out another piece of code that I already showed you on Friday. Uh, so this is not ZB related code, but it does have a quick example on how you could run something asynchronously in Java. Um, this one here. Um, so there's an object complete, uh, called completable future and has some um, static methods that you can just use to um, kick off some asynchronous work. And in this case, um, running something asynchronously. Again, it's a Lambda and um, in this case, I'm also delaying it by 500 milliseconds, but I wouldn't have to delay it. I could just use run async to just kick off some work asynchronously. And whenever it comes back, I, I, I could then do something. In particular, uh, if, for example, if I do REST calls, I would result to some reactive REST framework. And there's like tons of REST frameworks for Java. And um, for example, this run async here would just use the standard, uh, I think, fork join pool, it's called. Um, so there's like the standard thread pool that stuff is running on. So, so one of the configurability. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if I'm maybe confusing here. Um, so one thing what we could do is um, the client could expose the, the the thread pool that it has so that then the handler could also do asynchronous work and schedule something on the same thread pool. But then it also depends on what I'm doing here. If, for, for example, do a REST call, um, then it depends on the REST framework, whether that REST framework would automatically come with an own thread pool or whether mm. it uses the standard fork join pool of Java, or maybe it allows me to schedule something on my own executor. So you see in the ZB client builder implementation, um, we see here there's the, the thread pool, which gets build here, build executor service. This is just part of the start of the client. Um, let's maybe drill into that from the client, right? So at the moment when I say build here, new client builder build, um, implementation would be good. Then um, there are some Overrides for security, then I think apply defaults. That's also not so interesting. And then we do a new client info. And that builds a channel and goes further down. Yeah, basically connects to ZB, um, builds a gateway stub, which is kind of the object that is used for the communication and then as you can see, those are basically some overloadings here. So I'm just going from method to method and then build executor services then pretty quickly. The thing that builds the thread pool. And it just takes a single configuration parameter, which is the number of worker execution threads, just parameter that's one by default, and then gets us this thread pool. And that's then just saved inside the configuration of the, where was I? of the client. Yeah, here we see it. It's assigned to a, to a property of the ZP client object, and that's it. And then from there, it's used internally, but it's never exposed to the handler. So it could be something. I, <clears throat> I wouldn't expose it to the handler. Yeah. That sounds like a support nightmare. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> e exponential complexity. <gasps> mm. Yeah. I mean, well, it, it's, it's probably not a big deal if they uh, if the client would spawn own threads, own thread pools, but it could also be a certain efficiency if we just reuse the existing one. It's not I have a quest question question about that. Software. You know, if I'm mm -hmm. using a um, say an Amazon T2 micro instance, which has like a 0 0.5 vCPUs or whatever, what does it have? I can tell you exactly. It has one vCPU. Um, how many threads does that have? So one vCPU in cloud language is exactly a hyper thread on a CPU. It's um, one thread. So, yeah. 
So actually a good point because we are talking a lot about metal here. Let me bring up a slide maybe. Did I just close that? Perfect. <laughs> the tab that I just said open. Uh, I think I need to stop my screen sharing and share something else. I know what I'll just go for this entire screen. Um, so you should be seeing my browser now with a little photo here. Yes. Mm, oh yeah, I've got to add it to the stream. There we yes, go. Yes, please. Okay. Now we got it. So this is a die shot of a uh, of a Haswell CPU from Intel, Haswell microarchitecture, and that in particular is an eight-core CPU. And you can see here in yellow, this, those are all the cores. Then in blue, we have the level three cache, which is a shared cache of the of uh, yeah. Yeah, amazingly a uh, shared memory cache between all the cores. And then we have the memory controller, which will actually go to the main memory, to the RAM as we know it. So, and then each core in such a CPU has two hyper threads. Um, I don't think it's really visible in this, um, but yeah, basically you know, on modern CPUs, the, each core would have two logical processors. And that's what you would see if you look into, um, you know, into, like operating systems, um, they, you wouldn't see eight cores here, you'd actually see 16 cores or 16 processors that are displayed in your operating system on the CPU. And a vCPU in cloud language is exactly one of these hyper threads. And that's also what was, could then be used for our threads in, in our ZB client. So for example, in your Node.js application, you would use exactly one of those hyper threads. Um, so, and how was it? Node is completely single threaded, right? Node runs on a single thread by default, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it means that you... for Node.js, then it doesn't make sense at all to assign it to more than a, th a vCPU in, in the cloud, right? Unless it does any, I don't know, native stuff that could then have other threads. No, I don't think it does. Yeah. I mean, in the in the garage benchmark, I do spawn a separate thread, a child process to put the worker in. And then I have the starter, you know, the workflow instance starter is in one thread and then the worker is in another thread. Mm -hmm. So they don't interfere with each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, in that case, then it could work. Okay, so when I'm running a ZB broker on a, so if I'm running a ZB broker in a Kubernetes with like a, you know, 0 0.5 CPUs pod, I've got what, half half of a virtual thread? Exactly. So you are, you have, you have basically a quarter of a core. <laughs> okay, and then the preemptive, preemptive multitasking of the operating system is actually scheduling. So there'd be an overhead from that as well. Exactly. So you would definitely, you at maximum, you get the CPU for, uh, for example, in, in one second, you would get it for a quarter or for a second or no, for half a second uh, on the hyper thread. And then you would get interrupted. And probably it, you get interrupted a lot more than that in one second. Mm. Okay. So your performance will be pretty bad with half a C, half a, CPU unit, whatever they're called in Kubernetes? Or not necessarily. It depends on what you're doing. So for example, if we come back to that rest call example, then it might not impact you so much because uh, if, you, if all you're doing is network bound, you don't need that much CPU time, right? So you have that really slow rest call of uh, like, 250 millisecond response time. I don't know, going from Berlin to Australia could be that time um, or New Zealand where you're based right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I've actually have customers that 
some, for some reason have REST calls that just take that time in processing. Maybe it's not network time that you spend, but the, the REST service needs time to, you know, maybe do some JSON processing and then call some other systems. Database. Maybe there's even a slow SOAP-based XML web service call and the database and whatnot and behind, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so then all the time that you're waiting for that network request to respond, uh, you don't need the CPU at all. So your thread might very well be swapped out of the CPU and you, some other stuff gets running. So in that sense, if you program that asynchronously, it's all good. Um, if you program it synchronously in a single threaded application, then you have a problem because then your thread is basically sleeping all that time, but it can't do anything else. Your code is written in a way that you're blocking the threat. Obviously, the, um, the operating system will then offload it from the physical CPU, and your neighbor that uh, has the other um, the other half of vCPU will actually ha be happy because it can can only use the time. Um, and then, yeah, only if that network request comes back, the threat will be waking up again through an interrupt and get uh, scheduled on the CPU again. So that would be a very, um, I mean, that's how we have it today, right? The Java client is using a thread pool. Our handler implementation tutorials always show you how to do it in a synchronous way. So probably many people will just write these things synchronously and then block their threads. Okay, let me just quickly reply to a customer here. <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> yeah. Meeting for later. Um, If I had hidden that better by asking you some question. <laughs> anyway, let's move on with the code. Um, that's not All right. So uh, maybe let's go back to our application code and just review how this whole uh, setup works, so that that we can see how the thread pool gets to use. So. Um, once we started our workflow, here is where we register the, the job worker. And maybe just since I see it here, it's not necessary that the job worker gets started before the workflow. Um, ZB will just queue up any jobs that are in this workflow, right? We started the old order process here. And then um, whenever the worker comes in, the jobs will be started to be processed. So in this situation, we will actually be happy because we, when uh, the moment we start the worker, we already have jobs available in the engine. Okay. Oops. So. Oops. I think I just started this. That's. Do you, uh, oh, you have a broker running already, huh? Uh. Do I? It oh, says connected to broker, right? So interesting. Do I have a broker running? Maybe I have a Docker container somewhere. Maybe Docker. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, I might want to revisit that. Um, interesting what you find out. But I mean, how would I be a ZB consultant if I don't have a broker running? <laughs> Let's just, get, just go full screen. Um, so uh, the client, I wanted to revisit the open method here because that's where a lot of magic happens, obviously the implementation of it. So um, 
yeah, first of all, we just ensure that our parameters are set up correctly and nothing got forgotten in the setup. Um, then this is an interesting one. We are preparing the activate job request. So this is the gRPC request that will be sent to the broker every now and then. And it would contain the job type. It would contain a timeout for this job. So in this case, it's called a, it was called a payment worker. And well, we didn't set any timeout here, so it will use a default timeout. And the default timeout, let's look that up real quick, um, is five minutes. Uh, so five minutes will be the time that this worker has time to finish and finish a job. If it doesn't finish the job in that time, then ZB will think this worker has died and crashed and then uh, we'll reschedule the same job for another worker. Mm. Okay. Um, um, also, each worker has a name. That way it can be identified and uh, ZB can like distinguish similar, uh, different workers, even if they, for example, work on the same job type. And um, yeah, then a very important property is the number of maximum jobs to activate. This is really what controls how many um, how many jobs are queried inside ZB. And initially, this is initialized with the maximum jobs that are allowed to be active. So not to be confused here, max jobs to activate. This is for one acquisition round how many jobs the gateway should, should look up. And maximum jobs active is the limit of this worker. So of the entire ZB client, we are limiting how many jobs can be active. Or in fact, yeah, no, it's not for the entire client. It's particularly for this job type. And I'm wondering how it is. It could, of course, register multiple workers. I don't know if that gRPC supports that. We could have a look at that. I remember you said that last time. Hmm. How would we look at that in an easy way? Could probably drag out ZP documentation. I think we have the protocol documented in there, right? Do you remember where there was the protocol? Maybe if... hmm. just in the box, but maybe we can just look at the thing. Jobs sounds like a good search term. Activate jobs requests. Let's give it some more font size. Ah, this is even a really good uh, little bit of information here. So this gRPC command, if we send it in from the worker to the gateway, the gateway will iterate through all known partitions in a round robin and activates up to the requested maximum, uh, maximum number of jobs, and then streams them back to the client as they are activated. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's an interesting one, right? So, um, yeah, you could get some really weird through end-to-end uh, -end latency effects happening if you starve, if you overload one partition. Yeah, you know, like if if it's if you're asking for four jobs at a time and you're always getting them from partition one, anything that got created on partition four is never going to get serviced. So you'll get some ones that complete really quickly, and then some other ones that never complete at all. Mm. 
I'm not sure it is that simple. Um, if I remember correctly, but we can of course double check that. If I remember correctly, then this is, uh, it remembers what partition it, it served from the last time and then would uh, okay. continue from another one. But sure, this is something to be reviewed. It, uh, there should be a certain fairness. And in fact, this whole right, iterating is something that is in debate. Um, let me see, I think I might have, I might have this open. There was a discussion already going on in engineering whether mm -mm. this maybe should move into a more, um, no, I don't have it open anymore. This should be more parallelized. <laughs> the problem is obviously for the gateway, um, this maximum jobs to activate is, is considered a hard limit. And it's important uh, to be a hard limit for the fact that you want to have load balancing among multiple workers for the same topic. So, um, well, the default value to start with in the Java client is 32. Um, 32 jobs at a time. Exactly. Uh, where was Per that? request, maximum. Here we see it, right? So, um, and no, that's actually even the maximum jobs that the worker has active at any given time, even okay. independent of the requests. And only, obviously the first request when we just started the worker will go in and ask for the full set of 32. That's exactly what we've seen here in the, in the client implementation, if I still find it. I'll be back in a second. I just got to deal with something here. Sure, no worries. So here we can see the activate job request that is created up on uh, opening the client and that will just take the entire max jobs active in it. Um, yeah. And yeah, this will be a hard limit because the the different, if you have multiple workers that are working on the same topic, they should obviously load balance. And if one of them would be too greedy, let's say acquire a thousand jobs uh, immediately, then if they are timed a little bit bad, then one client could come in, acquire a lot of jobs, acquire all the jobs that are there and the other client, the other worker would just starve out and didn't get any work. And depending on the capacity of the workers, this can or cannot be a problem. Um, may or may not, right? Um, so if, for example, then one client is, is at, at max capacity, for example, if we talk about the vCPUs there, right? If the CPU is, is overloaded, then um, would be actually better, more than beneficial that the other worker gets some jobs to work on and it balances out. So f for that reason, you don't want to have this, you don't want this to be extremely big. Um, the problem on the other hand is this, and this might be really an area where we could improve the Java client. It's only one configuration parameter here. So we see this maximum jobs to activate in one acquisition request is like either the maximum jobs that can be active in the client or well, as we will see later, it's the uh, whatever is still uh, available as a capacity. And now if I have a lot of jobs in ZB, then I have a bit of a dilemma here um, because either I have, I can set the maximum jobs active very high to have a lot of worker capacity. I could, that com I could combine that with a big th thread pool or for example, with asynchronous programming. Um, let's say I need to do many, many rest calls and, and do them in parallel. Then for example, with a standard setup, I might be inclined to, I might be tempted to do a very big thread pool. But then a single worker would acquire a lot of jobs and potentially not work efficiently to 
um, you know, have jobs available for other jobs and uh, for other workers, leave jobs available for other work workers. So I guess what I'm saying is could be good to split up or have a separate configuration parameter to limit the number of jobs per activation per per activation request and have a higher overall capacity that I could max out if I just do multiple requests. So as long as I have capacity, um, for example, I could have a setup where I say maybe 32 is my number of maximum jobs to activate in one request, but my thread pool has a capacity of 100 jobs to be parallel processed in parallel. And that way I could um, yeah, process more stuff. And in fact, uh, the thread pool has a queuing. Um, I think we've seen that in the comment that I showed earlier. Right? So our thread pool that we have is having a limited number of threads, but it has an unbounded queue. So I could already queue up more tasks in my thread pool so that then uh, whenever the capacity is available, I could even push it in. So does that mean that the polling thread grabs the, the jobs, come back, and then it passes them into its scheduled executor, which then handles the scheduling of those job handlers? Is that, how's that, is that how that works? Yeah, that's exactly how it works. And I think uh, we, we should show the audience to, to see how that works, right? So if we just go back to our open uh, method here, um, yeah, we will then basically also create a polling thread, a poller, and that will then finally hand off jobs to the thread pool. And here's also one thing that I, that I didn't find so optimal in my review on Friday. I mean, it depends always on the workload. Mm -hmm. um, we're using a scheduled thread pool of a fixed size. Yep. Which means, um, yeah, it has a fixed limit. And if I reach that limit, then I might have a, an artificial boundary that I'm hitting, especially if I do some job work that is not CPU bound. If it is CPU bound, then a fixed thread pool size is actually really good. Because then um, if I'm CPU bound, I don't want to be context switching for stuff that just also um, runs on the CPU. Mm. So, for CPU bound workloads, you would want to have a number of threads that is roughly equivalent to the number of CPU um, vCPUs that you have, right? So coming back to our um, processor of earlier, do we still have it open? No, no, I close that. Um... Ah, it's in Spanish. Yeah, my system is really weird. It's a mix of Spanish, German, and English. Um, okay, so on this Haswell CPU that we looked at earlier, we have eight cores. That means we have altogether 16 hyper threads. And if I have a workload that really does computation and doesn't have any other limits than how many CPU instructions I can process, then I would be good if I actually use 16 threads in my application. And that's, for example, what we do on the ZB broker side. We usually optimize so that we can process one partition for each vCPU. And then we have this uh, value of the CPU threads that you configure in the broker, which you usually want to assign in a way that um, yeah, you have one thread available for each vCPU that you have access to. And then maybe you have some IO threads, but um, IO threads have the nature that they are IO bound. So they do work that goes down to the disk, for example, uh, or down to the network when you go for elastic search export, for example. So these kind of threads, they don't need a lot of CPU time because they then will block on IO operations. And in that case, um, whenever they block for IO, they will then be loaded off the CPU and we can use the CPU for more processing. So usually I would go for configurations where, well, let's say I have this entire CPU available here with 16 hyper threads, then I would probably configure ZB to have 16 CPU threads 
and maybe a handful of I.O. threads. And then I would probably max out the CPU quite nicely because, um, yeah, my I.O. threads would from time to time get some CPU time to do processing for the I.O., but as soon as they are blocked for I.O., they get loaded off the CPU and I can do more partition processing. Um, at least that's the theory. In practice, we are at the moment a little bit more bound by the level three cache, as you can see here, um, which is shared in the middle. Um, and that means that we are a little bit suboptimal on how we how good we can leverage the CPUs. So right now, um, we use a lot of cache, and therefore, it's um, it's a little bit more tricky to max out the CPU itself. If we try to push too much, too many partitions through the same CPU, we might have collisions on the cache, and then that leads to cache misses, which means we have to go down to memory, which is a little bit slower. Slower. Unfortunately. Yeah. Other people would say memory is the new disk nowadays. So for an application, huh. like if you hit main memory, that slows you down by um, a massive amount. Because mm. let's let's talk in terms of clock cycles. If you go into into the cache, then maybe that's 10, 20, 30 um, CPU cycles that you lose, like instructions that you can't process in that in that cycle. Yeah. And if you need to go down to memory, this is a couple of hundred instructions that you cannot, like a couple of hundred clock cycles that you're losing. So we're talking, for example, something like 60, 70 nanoseconds um, on a CPU like this, whereas mm. cache access would be within maybe 10 nanoseconds for the L3 cache. And then never forget that the cores even have an L1 and an L2 cache. So that can even be, those caches are even faster. OK. so. That's probably a discussion for a totally different session when we drill more into CB's internal that's going, processing. That's going deep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's come back to our client code here. And yeah, I, can't, I guess where I came from was the fact that on a worker, you might not necessarily be CPU bound. And therefore, you can afford to have more threads if you have things that do I.O. Like network I.O. is a prime example. If you kick off a REST call in a blocking way, then you will have to, the thread will just not do anything while it's waiting for the response of that REST call. And in that mm. time, you could swap it out of the CPU and take another thread and push it in to get some actual comput computation done. So for a REST call, you only have, um, computation when you prepare the request, for example, when you prepare a JSON object, and then when you receive the response from the network, then you can use uh, the CPU again to do some processing on the response that you received, like parsing the JSON and doing whatever you need to do with it. So, and in the meantime, if you wait for a couple of hundred milliseconds on the on the network or on on that service that you're calling, in that meantime, yeah, you can't do any computation for this request, so you can parallelize. All right, so let's drill down a little bit deeper. Well, we still didn't answer that question of whether that gRPC request will actually support multiple topics. So activate job request. We have a worker, we have a type, and this is the job type here. And then we have a response. It looks a little bit like this is focusing on a single topic, right? Yes. 
I was pretty sure about that because if it had supported doing multiple uh, job types, I would have written some code to support that in the node client. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then I think what I have in mind is the gateway code. And between the broker and the gateway, the I think the commands do support multiple jobs. Okay. But that is then optimization, or optimizations between gateway and broker that we don't expose to the client. One very interesting question that comes up here is what happens to my threads if I run multiple job workers? Because in my client application, I might have this payment service worker, but then I could also create another worker for another job type, for example, right? I think my example process that I have here would actually have multiple topics to work on. Let me dig that out. Let's actually open a ZB modeler and then somewhere in here should be a resource. Yeah, so well, this is how my process looks like here. And I have a first task that is using the payment service type. And then the next one is an inventory service. And then I also have a shipment service. Now, so I could start multiple workers in the same Java client, no problem. What would happen oh. then is they would all use the same thread pool because the executor, as we have seen in the beginning, is already created when we build the client. Right. So somewhere here in the second, the third overloading of the constructor, we build the executor. And that is one executor for the entire ZB client, which does make sense because you don't want to have too many executors that are then fighting it out for the CPU. Yeah, you got like half a CPU, yeah, half a thread, or one one thread, and then like you slice it up even smaller and smaller. Yeah, the one point that I would challenge here um, is: Do we really need a? scheduled executor for everything or couldn't we also go with a normal executor because a normal executor in uh, in, in java would give you a property um, would, or make it possible that you say you have an unlimited thread pool that would just create as many threads as are necessary for the parallel work that we need to do hey um yeah just to checkpoint that for a second, how 2020 is this? One of my son's friends is in the stream, Daniel, and he's saying, can you tell Prahlad, that's my son, to unmute me on Discord, please? <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, I'm just going to do that. <laughs> nice. I'll be back in a second. Sure, take care of that. <laughs> as off topic as it could be but that's what you get for using a, a platform like twitch for the live streaming i guess technically speaking we are off topic on twitch anyway so um yeah so we can see the the same thread pool is used for everything here and the let me dig that out real quick so the scheduled executor as we've seen already is a fixed thread pool with an unbounded queue so that is fixed size. I need to configure it to a size and I can't, well, I think I might, no, it, it can also not be readjusted. That was also here um, mentioned somewhere that some of the yeah, adjustments don't work. And the other things then, yeah, for, for a standard thread pool, the thing that this is extending from, um, this could very well be behaving in a way that it uses a thread pool of unlimited size. So this is a custom, a custom implementation for the Java client. It's not using like the standard, I'd imagine that thing stand in the Java standard library. Yeah, both of them are. So the scheduled thread pool executor, um, as we can see here on the class path, this is a standard Java util class. Okay. Um, it's coming from the JDK. 
Um, and it's just an extension of the standard thread pool executor, which is also part of the JDK, um, which gives the scheduling capabilities. Okay. And the current implementation needs the scheduling capabilities. And maybe that was the reason why we then decided to say, okay, let's use a scheduled executor and just use it for everything because mm. it can also run stuff immediately without scheduling it. Um, the only downside is that scheduled executors are also limited, uh, always limited size. And a standard executor would have this nice capability um, that you might, yeah, no, it's not exactly how you are used to it from Node.js. Um, basically, by default, it starts with a single thread, and then it will automatically adjust the pool size um, as necessary. As you schedule things. Yeah. So as okay. uh, if I schedule something on the thread pool and there's no available thread, then it would immediately start a new thread until it reaches a maximum pool size, which by mm. default would be maximum integer, meaning like I don't know, 2 billion or whatnot, you know, ridiculously big number. So that would mean, um, yeah, obvi obviously that depends on my workload, right? If I'm using, if I'm having CPU bound workloads, then that might be a bad idea to to keep spawning new threads, and then ultimately we would be just competing yeah. for context switches and not doing any computation. <laughs> yeah. yes. Well, my suspicion is most ZB workers are then doing some kind of more I/O bound work because they tend to have a, a REST call or messaging to other systems. Database, yeah. Database access. Well, maybe asynchronous messaging could be uh, an, an edge case here. For example, if you kick off Kafka messages, then that might be relatively quick. And you might not gain too much from parallelizing a lot. So in that situation, you might rather use a limited size of thread pool and just do a little bit of context switching um, for the code that prepares the messaging. And then maybe uh, sends it out to Kafka. But the traditional REST call is most likely too slow to, um, and then if it's implemented in a blocking way, that, that, that could benefit from a, from this mechanic of a thread pool that's, that, that gets bigger. So um, then, yeah, so this could be an interesting topic. The, um, let's first look at the, th at the polar and then come back to this discussion again. Okay. So finally, let's review our code, right? Let me go in it from the client. So we are starting our job worker for the first time. We would go in open. We first prepare our active activate job requests. And at this point, we're just building the request, right? We are not sending it yet. It's just prepared. And so we have this request builder. Actually, we just initialize, initialize the builder with some standard parameters and park it in our job worker. Um, here we also see if variables are to be fetched, then this will also be configured in the builder. So we don't have so much payload to transport. Um, still, I still didn't understand completely what this deadline offset was for. And unfortunately it doesn't have a good explanation here either. It's apparently there is a 10 second extra headline offset that we are putting into our request oh. time. Mode. I think you had a similar reaction on Friday, but I don't remember exactly what your explanation was. <laughs> Josh? I think I'm still here, but my camera's freaking out. Okay. You know what I think it is? I think it's StreamYard's green screen uh, processing that does it. That packs your CPU? <laughs> yeah, that, that causes my camera to freeze. And so then I have to go and turn the green screen off, then turn it back on, then I come back. Hmm. Let me see. <clears throat> that reminds me of putting the the video to another screen so I can sometimes double check. Yeah. 
Yeah, now your video is good. All right. Um, so your reaction was not related to the deadline offset that I was talking about. It was not. I don't know. Some fine tuning, I assume. I have some suspicion, but maybe let's not go there for now. So the next interesting thing in the DB uh, job worker is that there is this polar. Um, and there's also a job runnable factory. That one, let's look into that real quick. Um, so this factory will be um, producing lambdas, which will then execute the job. Yes, Josh, nice video. <laughs> <laughs> yes, epic. If any of okay. anything was needed to distract people from this boring piece of code, you you now they're loving it. <clears throat> yes. Ah, oh, which way do I go? So, Get in the middle. This way. <laughs> um. So the yeah, this thing here will create a lambda for every job that gets uh, acquired. It's just and like then, JavaScript, man. It's got a callback. I love it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's your your style of programming. And the entire ZB client is like that, um, except for the handler method that the users provide. They, that's usually more synchronous in style. Hmm. Um, but it becomes asynchronous by default, right? Because of the scheduled executor. As long as they have more than one thread in the pool. Which they don't have for, by default. <laughs> okay, so out of the box, it's synchronous. But it could be asynchronous. It could be, it could be like a parallel, um, a pool, a, pool, <clears throat> a pool of parallel workers. We should document that. I think it is documented better now. And um, initially, or yeah, it's, it's something that people should find in the docs, I hope. Um, that was a bit of a discussion once. Oh, yeah, all right. Let's just quickly go through this. This is getting us a Lambda, which will then execute this execute job method. And here we see how the client handler gets invoked. This is the code that the, the handler would implement. And OK, there's just some error handling here. Cool. Let's go back. Let's actually close this thing again. So this factory will be then just handed over to our worker. Then let's look at the polar. The polar is a piece that will handle the acquisitions. And the core part of it is basically this poll method, which will also Yeah, this is the code where we actually do the acquisition. Here we can see our request builder builds the request and fires it off to the gateway. Um, so that request builder build, it's dynamic in some sense. It accesses some this property of the worker to tell what the capacity is. Um, no, this is passed on because this polar implements a stream observer. So this polar will also be the, the object that handles the, the responses for the job activation. And okay. we will see how that's configured in a later stage. Or do we see that here? Um, yeah, no, we don't see it here. It's... it's uh, you can see the gateway stuff, the request builder, all our objects that we had before are handed over here. But there's one important thing missing, and that's when the poll method of the job polar gets executed. And we will see that in a second. Um, yeah, I think at this stage, it's just all configuration and setup. So it's not super interesting. 
What is more interesting now is then when the implementation is started. Here we also pass on our polar or factory polling interval. Where does that come from? Polling interval, interval is another standard configuration parameter and it's default. Wait a second, I lost my Uh, I guess we see the defaults here as well, because this is the actual code of it. Um, job polling interval, 100 milliseconds. So by default, every 100 millisecond, the polling will be kicked off to check whether there are new jobs inside ZB. But that's obviously not the whole answer, because the ZB gateway will use long polling. So when we now start the first polling request, ZB's gateway will actually keep that request open for, well, from the client side, it will be at maximum 20 seconds. Um, yeah, no, for exactly 20 seconds. So that means um, until the client closes the request, the gateway will keep it open and then live stream any um, jobs that are coming in to that, to that worker. And that's where I say then the ZB broker gateway communication is actually supporting multiple jobs and uh, even multiple topics in the same message. Because that thing is called a job batch activation. So it's a batch activation and not just a single request. I mean, this one from the client is batch as well, but it's focusing on a single topic. So that also um, leads us to the conclusion that it's, it, it can be beneficial to use a single job topic because then acquisitions can be more batched than uh, in, in the case when you have many topics. So in my workflow where I have three different topics, then for each topic, I will send separate requests to the gateway. Okay, but back to our so they <clears throat> they did they that's that's the best design then the way they've done it. Um, in terms of like asking for a single job type at a time? Um, it depends. Well, the long polling takes a lot of the pain out. And each worker and will have one, each job type will have one, at least one thread. Um, and one polling thread? And one executor? No, uh, the th well, we have to d distinguish between tasks and threads. So the executor has a fixed size thread pool. By default, a single thread. Yeah. But on that thread, you can schedule different tasks to be executed. So that thread will be shared by many different, like computation jobs, computation tasks. That so you can schedule. You can you can use one job worker to work on more than one task type. Is that what you're saying? Um, well, you have to distinguish, right? The worker is just an object here that we are creating. Um, yeah. And the worker in, in this Java client consists of a polar, which is yeah. a task that we will see will be scheduled for to run in a certain interval, but it's using a shared thread pool. The, oh, the so this pool, job polar gets sh scheduled on the same thread as the... Handlers? As the execution, yes. Oh, okay. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> right. So you see the executor service, if we just zoom out a little bit, um, when we build our client, we are building our executor. Where was it? Um, build client. Here we are, right? Build executor service. And that's, that's basically a single thing. It's one object for the entire client. And it's okay. uh, 
by default, one thread. End of the story. And this executor service is then handed on when we create it, when we create the worker. So you can see here, open implementation. Um, the job worker implementation is initialized with this executor service. So that's the shared component. But on this executor, um, we can run multiple polars and also multiple um, jobs to be executed. Obviously, they cannot run in parallel. They have to compete for the time on the thread. Yes. Um, but they, uh, the executor service will take care of them scheduling this stuff. So there's basically a queue of, of tasks to be executed, and that queue is unbounded. So everything just piles up there, and whenever the thread is um, done with a task, it will uh, take the next task out of the queue and process it. Mm. So that means we have kind of the context switching on the CPU for different threads, and then we have the like mini context switching of the tasks on the thread. Got it. So, um, and but that's an important one, right? If I have multiple job types, I would have multiple of these polling tasks that are running in the same uh, executor. Because this yes. is done each time I uh, each time I create a worker, I would create also a new job poller. So now maybe let's go into the actual worker implementation here. Um, this is probably where we see some more interesting stuff. So we will see, um, well, obviously all the parameters are saved. And then this was a really important discovery that we've seen on Friday. The Java yeah. client is using a threshold to decide what would be the minimum number of jobs to or or when the when the polling would be triggered again i guess so what this means is let's say we have a default of 32 maximum jobs active and now um this activation threshold threshold would be 30 percent of that so for th uh, 32 it would probably be around 10 or something like that right Oh, I think it would be exactly 10 because 2 divided by 3 is uh, like 30% of 2 is just still like a not round number. And this is just rounding to a closest number. So yeah, that means uh, maximum jobs active will be 32 and this will the activation threshold will be 10. And that means we need to have... have now we will actually see how that works in a second. Um, first of all, we see the polar, and the polar that's really interesting. This is uh, saved in an atomic reference. And this will be important because the, this atomic reference will ensure that only one polling request is open at any given time. Mm. And uh, the job polar, well, that was this object that we created before. That's something I've got to put into the node client because it can open more than one request, I think. I have to check into it. But I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure it does. Opens more than one yeah. request at a time. Which is not so good because we have the long polling, which would also stream you jobs. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not efficient if you have multiple long polling requests open, for example. Yeah, the other thing is that, that that 100 millisecond scheduling there, it kind of acts as like a bit of a debounce for it because mine can, if it's going fast, like in in performance, in load testing, workers that do basically nothing can complete the job in less than one millisecond and then ask for more work. <laughs> this mm -hmm. thing can maximum, it can only poll once every 100 milliseconds max by default. Whereas the node client is, has no lower bound on its uh, polling. Yeah, that's true. So this could add a bit of a delay um, to the to the polling. And I did experience for latency sensitive uh, workloads that this is a problem. That's why sometimes I configure this um, the polling interval to be just one millisecond, which sounds a little insane, but will actually be caught by long polling. So I, I kind of want to 
ensure that we really just how many threads do you have when you do that oh just a single thread is fine or maybe multiple but okay well one this configuration first of all doesn't depend on the on the on the number of threads well because one thing that is ensured here is there's only one polling at the time we'll see that in a second so yeah. first of all let's see the scheduling here so this is the next important line um here we see the executor in in action and it has the standard method schedule with fixed delay which means we schedule that this method try activate jobs it's a method of the same class we see it down here and this method will be executed wait what's the second parameter um in initially with a zero millisecond delay so immediately because when we just start the job worker we don't have anything to wait for and we want to get jobs immediately right so initial delay yes. zero and then the polling interval will be the 100 milliseconds that i um, mentioned earlier so then every 100 millisecond this try activate jobs will be executed if the thread is available <laughs> if it's not then that would be a problem so and here you see he could see already a, a problem if you are single threaded and you do a long running rest calls um, in your jobs then you might actually for not come to the point where you're polling which indeed could be a good thing right if i'm if i'm busy with all my threads it could mean it is useful to stop polling but on the other hand that should already be controlled by my maximum jobs active and i shouldn't have an artificial limitation that if my threat is uh, is blocked I, I stop polling because maybe i would want to have a situation where i'm already i'm still working on stuff and in parallel to working on stuff i'm already asking for new work so you're like put it putting them into a queue in memory basically yeah exactly my my thread pool does have a queue which is unbounded i keep going mm. back to this to this class mm. here because it nicely says it's a fixed size thread pool with an unbounded queue it's my favorite comment in this class and actually a really important one because it it overrides the behavior of the base class on Friday night, when I spammed you on Slack, I, I, I kind of thought, yeah, this thread pool is unbounded. So we have many threads. It's super cool. It's already asynchronous. We don't have to worry about how much blocking code we write. And then then I found but this comment. And then, OK, forget <laughs> about everything I just said. The scheduled thread, ex thread pool executor is fixed size. OK. Um, all right. So. That's definitely something to, to to think about whether this is a good way to do it or not with this single executor. One could also think to use one executor with a single thread just for the polling stuff, which is a scheduled executor, and then have a second executor for the actual job work, which is unbounded, and then limit the number of maximum jobs active really just by this configuration parameter. So then you really have like a decoupling of the of the thread pool size from the activation because yeah if for example if zb has really a lot of let's say we are in a load peak and we have a lot of jobs piling up inside the engine it might actually be beneficial to already activate some more extra jobs than what you have available in your or when you have what you have what you have capacity for and i think this is kind of limited here by this uh, activation threshold ah this is it's, it's it's really a thing right you need to all balance this out and depending on your workload this could be a good default to have or a good behavior to have or i might or need not. to <laughs> I might need uh, it might be a totally terrible scenario and, and my current customer is actually in a situation where it seems like the worker doesn't perform good 
We even went to very crazy setups where we had a thousand threads, allowed a thousand jobs to be activated, um, but still see uh, a kind of a delay in the, in the job work. So yeah, and this could be due to these kind of effects. Right, um, let's move on here. So we schedule, try activate jobs with 100 milliseconds. That's where we were. Now every 100 milliseconds, this method will be executed. And the first thing it will do is it will um, find out how many jobs are still remaining. Remaining jobs is actually an atomic integer. So it's a thread safe integer that will be used by um, all the executor threads to kind of yeah, count what is still in, in the pipeline, so to say. Yeah. I'm wondering if actually the thread pool could know that, but nevertheless, it, we, we counted ourselves just to be sure. Um, so then, then we have a method should activate jobs. And it's fed with the remaining number of jobs. In this case, this should be zero when we are starting. And we are going into this when we come in here the first time. So it's zero. And here comes in the activation threshold, which was computed to be 30% of our maximum, which is 10. And here we mm. see now we have zero remaining jobs which is lower than 10. And that's why we are actually going to run a job activation inside ZB. So in other words, if we have 70% of free capacity, that's when we will start activating more jobs inside ZB. And in your case, um, in your node client, you even went when you have a single job. Yeah. <clears throat> so this Got. this speaks to what you talked about before, where you're you, th you don't have enough threads to do the work, but you're buffering work in memory. But here, oh. it's like it can buffer memory up to its maximum capacity, but it won't rebuffer until it drains down to thirty percent um, full. Then it will mm -hmm. pull in some more work to do. That's a good, that, that, that seems like a good um, balance because it mm -hmm. stops it from, from becoming completely um, max capacity and still asking for more work. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's actually bound on its work, not on getting work from the broker. It can get more yeah. work from the broker, but that's not going to speed your processes up because it ain't going to do the work but it's going to slow the broker down because it's going to be asking for more work all the time. So that's something I definitely need to put into the node client. Just mm -hmm. that one thing there may, may be all that's needed actually to make the node client optimize for performance. Mm -hmm. Sensible defaults. I think that's called. Yeah, exactly. Because those activation um, requests, and we will see how this works now if we go back, those activation requests will actually be some load for the broker. So yes. if you flood it with activation requests and even do them in parallel, then, um, I mean, we've just seen that, right? An activation request means... Iterates through all known partitions round robin and tries to activate up to the maximum number of requests. So your defaults are the same. Are you also having 32 as a default? Good question. Let me check. Um, ZB client node.js. Mm. Default max active jobs equals 32, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
You probably ported that over from the Java client, huh? Yeah. No. Yeah. So now each time you're sending that request, you will ask for 32 jobs and the gateway will go through all partitions to find you 32 jobs. So this will actually be one of those commands will potentially go through all your partitions. Like really it's a, you know, you're spamming all the brokers with that. And I'm not sure if the gateway has any smart to uh, identify, hey, this is the same worker asking for the same thing twice, then bulk that together inside the inside the gateway. You know what I've done? I just looked at the code. My code is the inverse of that. Mine asks for more jobs when it's when it has um, when it drops below seventy five percent. Then it will ask for more jobs instead of dropping below thirty percent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all I need to do is um, well, I should turn that into a constant rather than just a magic number. What would you yeah. call that? What, what's a good variable name for that a constant name? You mean what is a good um, name for the configuration parameter that should be exposed by the client? Um, <laughs> ultimately, yes, but in, in the moment, at the moment in here, it's a, it's a magic number, right? It's just well, zero point three f. I think job activation threshold is a pretty good name. Okay. Um, could it be so, anything more precise? Yep, worker capacity. Well, what it mean? it means threshold. The threshold is kind of the capacity limit, right? Yep. Um, I mean, you can interpret it in two in two ways. So it's like, but I think capacity. Worker capacity yeah. percentage? Yeah, well, it's the capacity would be 70%. So the, the number used here is kind of the inverse of the capacity. That's where that's, I got, that's why I ended up with 70%. Um, so you flipped it so around already? You're, it would be yeah. like, I'm about to, but I'm going to change it from being a magic number to a, a named constant. Or maybe it's kind of like load, like work. Here it is. Work capacity utilization. Job activation threshold. How about that? What do you think about that? Work capacity utilization job activation threshold. <laughs> Could it be longer? Um, factory. <laughs> I'll make it a class, a factory class, and then you get the factory back, and then you instantiate an instance of it. Yeah, obviously, it needs to be a strategy, right, that people can configure and overload. <laughs> like this. <laughs> That's the constant inside, but externally, I might give it a different... No, okay. I mean, it is a threshold. That's That's for sure. So the end now must be a threshold. And we are talking about the job activation. Look, so. it's got the approval. Ash says yes. There you go. <laughs> it's done. That's how we do open source coding. We just like make stuff up. And then if someone gives it a thumbs up, it just goes to production. <laughs> I'm just trying to, to, to think about a sensible name that doesn't just confuse people. Um, Let's do it in German. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we go. Ship it. Um, no. So let's just talk about it. This is what does it do when we reach that capacity or utilization, right? When we drop underneath a certain utilization, then we activate more jobs. Yep. Which is kind of what threshold means, right? So boundary value, yeah. In German. Schweinwirt? 
But the threshold doesn't really tell you if that is needs to be lower or, or upper. And just talking about activation threshold doesn't really tell you if it's the capacity that's that's meant here or the uh, or the load. Uh, so then. So it would uh, more trigger? be something like minimum remaining jobs for until activation or something like that, right? You know what I mean? What about this? Trigger job activation below this capacity. Boom. Yeah. That sounds like the, mesh, the, the method name, not like the variable name, though. <laughs> Underscore int. <laughs> what about then? Um, mm. How about I mean, how about also trigger? Accompanied by a nice, good documentation piece. That that, that could do it. fix it in the comments. That's this a yeah. winning strategy right there. What about um, trigger? Trigger job activation at this capacity utilization. Like this. Trigger job activation at this capacity utilization. So if I have less than 10 jobs in the queue, that would then trigger activation again. And if I have more than that left, I don't activate. So something simply like maybe min active jobs for activation. Anything it's not the act, it's it's not the minimum jobs though. It's the capacity utilization. It's a it's like a percentage. Yeah, and the way how we call this in the client already, at least in the Java client, is we talk about active jobs. So we mm. have maximum jobs active. Right, max jobs active is what we already yep. know. This is a language that people already have today. Um, in the command, we have a max jobs to activate. Sorry, um, this one here, max jobs to activate. And then this is a min active jobs. <laughs> Before we activate or to act now, yeah, minimum active jobs. It's a ratio, though. So we just call it inactive jobs. I think that makes it quite clear, right? Could it, could it be that simple? <clears throat> so I mean, this is the effect, right? We always try to keep that as a minimum, and if we don't have it, then we go out. I mean, it also, on the other hand, prevents activation when we we don't have that. So I guess I, I would vote for something like min active jobs for activation. <laughs> Minimum active jobs for activation. Or before activation. Until activation. Like what that. about what about trigger job activation capacity threshold? Trigger, uh, yeah, job activation trigger cap no capacity no. Yeah, I'm I'm worried. I'm not liking threshold because it doesn't tell you if you need to be below or above. So mm. I would rather combine it with something like minimum or maximum. And from my understanding, okay. minimum what, active jobs. What about this? What about trigger job activation at capacity? 
equals 0 0.3. Well, what about this? Get more jobs when capacity hits equals. The only thing that, that I don't like about that is that it sounds like a method name and not like a variable name. Hmm. What Man, about are we having our discussion trigger about job? <clears throat> well, there's only, you know, two things that are hard in um, computer science. It's like naming things, cache and validation and off by one errors. <laughs> Yeah, and and the the balancing of all these mechanics in ZB is almost at the complexity as cache invalidation. Yes, it's really a balancing act, and it needs good load testing and benchmarking studies to to figure out good configurations for particular workloads. Okay, okay what about if, this? What about this? What about this? Minimum yeah. capacity. What about this one? Can you see that? Um, Trick yeah, job activation one. at capacity level. Can I actually comment myself in here? Or do I need them? Um, yeah, probably I need yeah, to yeah, you can. Trick. You just add add the co comments on the side. Here's a here's a uh, suggestion from Ash. Job activation capacity minimum. That's pretty straight up. I actually quite like that. How about that? Job activation capacity minimum. Capacity minimum. Mm. That would be then 70%, right? Oh yeah, that's the problem with it, isn't it? Yeah. And this is and the exact problem I ran into. What people are used to, because we're talking about active jobs all the time, and now we're talking about a capacity. And capacity could actually be um, misleading because it could mean the thread capacity or a thread pool size and stuff like that. And my plan in future would be to decouple that from the activation stuff. So, um, so okay, what about this? What about this? Okay. Could we go in a direction to say minimum active jobs to trigger activation? To trigger job activation, maybe we don't get away with having two times. Job. And I don't, I can't comment in here because I'm just a participant in uh, Streamyard, so I probably have to go to. Uh, oh, on Twitch. Twitch. In order to, which I can probably do. Mm, the Obviously, thing is, I, though, so if I go. <laughs> it's it's not actually the minimum active jobs. It's the minimum active job capacity. Let me try something. Um, okay. You know what? I can just do it on my screen, right? <laughs> just get some. So I am thinking more min active. If I could type active jobs, that would be very clear. But I'm talking about how many active, uh, how many jobs are active, and I need the minimum of that. And now, and if I write it in a sentence, I would say before job activation. The only thing is that it implies an absolute number rather than a ratio. Ah, yeah. 
maybe min available capacity. <clears throat> but then again, it's now 0 0.7. even work i mean it's horribly long <laughs> it means you don't need a comment though yeah only thing is it's not a percentage it's divided by a hundred ah yeah it's a ratio then Yeah, I like it. I mean, the later part could go into the comment. The box, I mean, active jobs ratio. On the other hand, if I define the max jobs active as an absolute number, I might as well just set the minimum as an absolute number. Maybe. <clears throat> the only thing is that now, whenever you change one, you need to change the other as well. That's what I like about a ratio. Mm. Yeah, true. Then it's like self-computing and it maybe gives you a better sense of the balance that you're striking. If I put 32 and 10 there, then it's okay, roughly 30%. Uh. Mean active jobs ratio. And then I'll just as capacity to request more jobs becomes the Boolean condition. It's not closing and it has capacity to request more jobs. Sufficient has sufficient capacity. Has sufficient available capacity. I love it. I went with min active jobs ratio before activating jobs. Boom. Actually, to make it more um, compatible with what we already have here, should probably be. Sorry. It's a good point. Should rhyme. <laughs> So we have the max jobs active and we have min jobs active ratio. Yeah. And then we have a nice long Java doc for it when. Number of active. There you go. Ash says it's got the seal of approval. Nice. <laughs> Crowdsourced variable names. It's the future. Yeah. Thanks for the feedback, Ash. <laughs> Thanks for keeping up with our rumblings here in the morning. <laughs> um, uh, Ash is in uh, Brisbane, so Australia. So it'll be the afternoon oh. for him. <clears throat> Even though Falco and I met in Berlin, uh, you lived in Brisbane, right? Yes, indeed. I did live in Brizzy um, shortly before I joined Camunda. Which suburb were you in? Uh, 
names. Um, I remember I used to work. Uh, I used to work in downtown, obviously, and then um, I was always walking through the Roma Street Gardens to work. It was a bit of a thirty-minute walk, so I forgot the name of this uh, suburb. Somewhere like Red Hill or something. Yeah, it could be. I think that was close. Okay, now you know you're poking me. I'm looking it up now. Okay. It's pretty cool because uh, there was an area which was uh, in which many houses were um, like hosting international students. So we were just partying in each other's houses every now and then. Uh, maps would be good. I think it was Kelvin Grove. Oh, yeah. 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 Was it? Close to QUT. Yeah, exactly. I was just walking through a Roma Street Park and then um, crossing the street, and then Kelvin Grove was where I was living. It was cool. All right, back to this. Um, so, when the number of active jobs drops below this threshold. Our jobs will be requested from As long as more jobs are active, the job activation <laughs> will be suspended. Right. Okay, so that would be an easy pull request to do. I'm not sure if we want to do it right now because at some point I have to leave and attend some other business. Do some real work. Well, this is partly related to real work, but... 100%. So um, let's go a little bit deeper in here. Uh, we still wanted to review this job activation, right? So we have already seen this get scheduled every 100 milliseconds. Then we um, check whether we are below our threshold. So in this case, if we have less than 10 jobs in our queue, and this is literally in the, I mean, it's queued in this queue of the thread pool. And at the same time, we remember how many remaining jobs we're having in our little integer. So we can very quickly um, count them and be sure what, what number we have. Um, then we will run activate jobs. Activate jobs is a little bit funny. It will first um, get and set the polar. So I mentioned that earlier. The polar is a uh, kind of a singleton object in, in other language. Um, so there's only one of this available. And to ensure that only one thread or one active task is always using it, um, or in other words, to ensure really that we are only polling one at a, once at a time, um, it's set to zero here, uh, to null. And uh, then the, the, the reference is kept in a local variable. And you can see here, there's a null check following. So if I get and set this and get null back, then we just skip this whole method and nothing happens. Cool. Because that means another thread is probably currently working with this. Um, so then 
yeah, we get the remaining jobs. At the beginning, this will be zero. We, for some reason, again, go into uh, should activate jobs. This is probably just some prevention of a race condition between getting this polar and checking. Or maybe also if something has finished in the meantime, well, that wouldn't activate it. Should. Now, I think this is more we want to double check if the, why would this be relevant? No, I think what this could prevent is if we have multiple polars active, then maybe another polar could have just filled up the remaining jobs. So that's right. why I double check. There's a race condition between the polars if it's multi-threaded. This is just yet another check. So well, each of these threads in the thread pool has uh, has its own polar. Nope, it's not. It's unrelated to the threads. Um, each of the workers that we start for 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 different job types, for example, yeah, would have a polar. And if my thread pool is bigger than one, then they could be multi-threaded, and therefore there could be race conditions between the polars. So let's say I, I do something like this. Um, I have my job worker for the payment, and I also have a job worker for, what was it, inventory. But isn't it that when you call new worker, it creates a new polar? Mm -hmm. Running on the same thread pool. So one has to be a bit careful between the, the threads. So there's one job polar for the whole application across all of the workers. Doesn't that mean that it's blocking different job types? Um, in a single threaded implementation, yes. So if you do this with, uh, you have multiple workers for the uh, for multiple job types you really want to increase your um well would you yeah because of long polling so let's assume my payment service doesn't have any work right now but my inventory service does if i'm yep. single threaded i am blocking am i blocking a second no i'm not blocking because each of those is single threaded right yeah, well, it's no, no. I only have a single thread for executing everything, but the job requests are actually non-blocking, so there's no problem there. So the scheduled executor is in the client rather than in the worker. Yeah, the the executor is again here built when we build the client, right? New ZB okay. client. This is where the executor is built. So the client is the thing that does the. Uh... Somewhere, I think, yeah, it is in here in the ZB client impl that has the executor. And that will then just be passed on to the different workers. Okay. We should go through the Go client next and have a look at that. Oh, yeah, that sounds like a fun exercise. Um, okay, so if I have multiple workers here, that's not too bad. Um, I can do that. The requests will run in parallel, but then it could lead to the fact that, for example, my payment service is going to pull, and at the same time, I'm getting inventory jobs. So then I have a race condition between thinking I need to pull because my, my threshold is reached but at the split second, uh, I'm receiving new jobs from the other requests that I have open. And therefore, it makes sense to just double check very quickly before we do the actual polling. Double check again if we need to. Um, let me go in here again. Open implementation. Implementation. Right. So better just do this quick integer check again right before we are really doing it. Right, because it could be updated. Yeah. And one could even think about doing it 
again when we my audience is getting with you. So, so, so uh, here's an interesting bit. We are calculating the number of jobs to activate. I actually don't like this variable name. Mm. Jobs, max jobs to activate is really what that is, right? Exactly, yeah. I'm tempted to start that pull request now because <laughs> this is an easy thing to fix and the code will be a bit more readable. Let's do um, it, let's anyway. do it. I knew you would say that. Um, CV client, let's go into the code there and better stream before we start. Uh, yep, good, your coach. Somebody was working on the weekend or somebody started working already. Um, so where are we job working in the This is literally a, a protocol message, right? So we sh it would make sense to just use that same language here in the code of the client. Boom. Um, stops active. This is our uh, thing in the client. Um, and obviously here, we're not using the threshold. We just say, um, what is our capacity to fill up the maximum? So we take the current remaining jobs and then work with that. Yeah. Okay, and now comes the interesting bit. Now we are kicking off the polar. Um, max jobs to activate is our input here. So this this input will then go into this request builder that we saw earlier and just modify the the pre built request to adjust to what is available in capacity. Um, then as a, here we see nice asynchronous programming. Um, the Polar will receive a callback for the job consumer. So this method submit job will be invoked whenever we got an activated job from the broker. And then we saw that code earlier. This goes um, into our job runnable factory, create the Lambda to actually you know, um, work on the job. So this job polar poll calls that method for each of the jobs that it gets back. Yeah, let's maybe go in here, right? So. Um, what do we pass? We have a, the, the maximum. Because I know that thing we... comes back as an array of jobs. Um, yes, let's go in here. Implementation. So this will, uh, the Pola itself has a job consumer, uh, a done callback, and a um, supplier. And um, these are the things we pass in here. But then internally, it has an on next, which is doing the iteration. Hmm. Um, oh yeah, here you see it. It's basically get jobs as list from the stream. Um, OK, there it is. Map over it for each job to, consumer. Yeah, exactly. So that's the iteration. And well, this on next is probably on meaning in terms of next response from the gateway, because this is also, I think, a streaming implementation. So the jobs are streamed from the gateway. Yep. Um, exactly. It's also a stream observer here. No. Yeah. 
So and uh, maybe that piece was missing, right? When the poll is invoked, um, we will kick off the gateway stop. We will the timeout is used here. Request build a build. Let's somehow hand it over. Debate jobs. No. There must be some other method in folk here. Uh, here, this is what I was looking for, right? When poll gets invoked, we change the request that we have pre-built when we started the worker, just adjust the number of max jobs to activate. And here is named correctly, right? In the other method, it wasn't. Yes. Um, and it invo invokes poll, which will then call the gateway. And before that, it sets its own properties so that then uh, it's implementing this interface correctly and has all the things necessary for continuing whenever it gets called back. So this is all super nice because it's 100% asynchronous code. Um, no blocking in here. We just submit our handlers and callbacks and off it goes. OK. Um, enough from the poller. Then we can see here, whenever we receive a job, we'll invoke submit job here, which we'll call the runnable factory. Runnable factory will create a Lambda to execute the actual handler for the job that is provided by the client, right? So this here, really handler handle, this is what we implement in our Lambda in the client code. I think handle actually takes a uh, functional interface. Uh, come on, can I go there? Let's go here. Job handler. Uh, this is a functional interface, means you have to provide a method or a function or a lambda with two parameters. Takes a job client and an activated job. Okay. Um, let's zoom out from there. exactly where and handle. Um, and you can see here, this is an important bit. The same executor is used to then run the jobs this, uh, themselves. And in this case, we're just calling execute, which means, <laughs> well, it executes the given command at some time in the future. And in fact, this Java doc is misleading or it's generic, right? In our case, we have a thread pool of a fixed size. So whenever that thread is available, this command will run on it. And there's no delay, although if we have a, sch a scheduled executor, um, we, we don't delay this any further, of course. Um, we just wanna run it directly. Okay, so that means we understood this code quite nicely. Um, and then there's one only remaining bit here. Once we received activated jobs, um, I think this is just a count because we can add and uh, get an edit, add and get it to the integer here, to the atomic integer. Yeah. So at the end, we just update remaining jobs and then return the job polar to this property so that then another iteration could pick it up and work with it again. And let me just go in there one more time. Open supplier. Done callback. Oh, yeah, here. The done callback is invoked whenever the polling is done. We have some info logging here. And 
polling done is implemented on error and on completed. What I'm, I'm not sure about, and that's probably where we have to do um, a bit of a review of the gateway code is, um, will the gateway return immediately once we have the first jobs? Or will this request be open until we finally received all the jobs that we asked and Then for? stream all of them at once. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. In my implementation, the gRPC library takes care of it. Yeah, but the gateway site needs to uh, implement it in the right way, right? So yeah. gateway site, I'm more curious, is it, you know, if it receives any job, it just streams it immediately it and uh, closes the request? Or would the request really stay open until all the 32 jobs, for example, have arrived that I was waiting for? Or the client closes? Uh, um, the way I wrote my code, it's like stream on data and then what it gets in the data is the array of the job. So it seems to, even though it's called a stream, it's basically, it just returns an array of jobs. So there's not multiple, there are not multiple events that fire in response to this, there's only one. Could we see that in the protocol? I mean, this sounds more like a request response scheme here, right? I receive a response. Yep. And that contains a list of activated jobs, which is then the job. I don't know why it's implemented as a stream, actually, because I, I had to implement different code for the streaming responses, and this is the only streaming response. Mm -hmm. But it just functions exactly like a synchronous request response. Is it maybe because of the long polling? No, it did it before long polling. Or is there a chance in gRPC that this response itself is streamed as uh, over a longer time? Like, Could let's be. say if this is a list that you know I'm starting to send a list, and then as jobs come in, the gateway pushes them step by step. Could be, and then it gets handled by that underlying gRPC library that I'm using until it gets the end of the stream. Mm -hmm. And it, a code on the Java client reads a little bit like that. Be interesting to see that in action, right? So we have the long polling open. Um, the request has a timeout. Where's the request? Here we are. Um, with deadline after. And duration. Yeah, basically this is when the seconds or no is that somewhere else already yeah by default we keep an, an, a, a client request open for 20 seconds so the gateway has 20 seconds time to get me any available job uh, available jobs and now it seems like we have this on next which gives us an activate jobs response and then from there it gets us a list no. so then it's it, this code reads like i could receive multiple of such responses yes and that's probably what we would see in the gateway But I, I have a feeling um, that's that's another session to review the gateway code. Yes. And I would like to do it, but let's see. Maybe let's think offline to see if we can find another slot this week to, to do that review. Sure. It's important. Okay. Now. I've seen this polling stuff. See how the execution gets scheduled. I think this brings us to the end of the session, right? It's pretty
pretty much seen everything going on in here. We've seen activate jobs. And that's pretty much all the magic that there is. Now, obviously, the code that we have been reading was mostly just setting stuff up. But then we've already seen the, comp the individual components that are being set up. And then, well, in the end, it's just kicked off. And as soon as stuff gets scheduled on the executor, that's about it. The polling will start working. And when then uh, jobs come in, they get executed. And what we have seen here was really a nice and modern way to implement logic like that. Um, so we've seen here method handles to you know, bring in callback functions or, or pass in functionality to the executor. Um, this is all non-blocking code. The only blocking piece of code that we have here is actually the, the job handler. Oh, and maybe one thing that deserves a review is this last bit, the complete command. Yes. And well, this is this is actually a piece of code that is under control by the client. And in this case, this is a blocking implementation because the join here will block the thread until um, until. Yeah, the request is complete. Yeah, you see, wait if necessary for the computation to complete. Um, this is a bit of an, uh, a thing. This might already be a reason to think about asynchronous implementation of the client. Why'd they, why'd they join it there? Why don't they just send it? I... Um, mm, yeah. I guess it will throw if it can't complete the job, in which case the handler will then, the thing that wraps this will then try to fail the job. Mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, that, that's the point, right? It uh, throws runtime exceptions. Maybe that was the desired effect that if anything was wrong on the gRPC level there, that, uh, or, well, well, if anything goes wrong, that this throws an exception. But I'm wondering if join is then a good way to implement it because join is a blocking implementation. So my understanding is that this join will block our thread while ZB is working on the completion. And um, depending on the current workload of ZB, this might take some time. Yeah, true. So I'm tempted to say, isn't there a different way to implement this? And like, could you return it? You could return it and then handle the failure. Yeah, that is one way. Or just uh, although, yeah, with a yeah, callback. Yeah. Could make a method overload for this handler thing so that it can either return void like it does now so it takes a function that returns either void or returns a completable future or whatever that send returns some kind of some kind of future yeah exceptionally that was what i was looking for So instead of joining, I could say, let's register a callback function. And then let that mm. be invoked for the exception. And yes, actually, right. it would be good to um, just see what's the interface. Mm. <laughs> I think it 
Savior. Probably a lambda that takes an error. Complete job response. I think you have to write the uh, types in front of the instance names, right? Oh, yeah, maybe because I'm not implementing uh, here. But, well, I mean, this is this should be just inferred from the interface that it expects. Let's look at this um, open calculation. What does that function return? Nothing. Yeah, but it needs to be a function with two parameters, a throwable. Yeah. And, um, well, this is generic here, so it needs to extend some base type. So, okay, let's look at how this thing looks like here. Atom. Things, right? I mean, and the types are defined already by my. Um, actually, this is bad coding style here, anyway. In Java, you, you kind of have the best practice to do one dot per line because if you have any null pointer exception, you, you know exactly where that comes from. Um, so, Maybe one could say throw in your runtime exception. Or could it be? Do I need to do this before? No, I don't think so. Not send returns the completable future or something like that. ZB future in this case. And then I could say exceptionally do this. Hmm. Oh, Maybe I'll this. This is not exactly correct. Um, apply. Version signature doesn't match the signature of the functional interface. Okay, here it says no type, so then maybe I should give it a type. Oh, 
Yeah, and I was kind of expecting that I have that already. Okay, I mean, maybe we don't have to fix this right away, but um, I guess my point here was really that we do this in a callback rather than in a blocking way so that we free the thread and then Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it makes it more complex to program, though. I mean, you might as well say just you send. The only thing I'm not uh, sure about is if, if then any exception will be reported. No, it won't. It sounds a little bit like, okay, if you don't wait for the result and you don't get any you won't problem. otherwise the, the only way to do it would be to return that from your lambda and as we discussed last time already um, you will want to react to those exceptions anyway because if this for example indicates that um, that you are I know what maybe throwable is just not the only thing What does the what does the error message say? Um, the method exceptionally, which is of type like which expects a function with a throwable and a complete job response parameter. Uh, is not applicable for the arguments no type no type. Oh, yeah, so it kind of says uh, yeah, types. This they said the types that didn't work either. Now what does it say? Oh wait, this is maybe something I need to. Yeah. Uh, is this the client object? Throwable complete job response. Throwable complete job response. Okay, maybe I did import the wrong type because there were two of those. No, that, uh, oh, maybe, yeah, maybe. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Nope. I mean, we can check that. Um, I think well, even if you did do that, right, when it throws that new runtime exception, that's not going to get um, handled by the same words. It's not going to get caught by the same context exception handler that's wrapped around the handler because that handler is run synchronously inside the thread scheduler. And then it basically wraps it in a try catch. If you if you send and then put the exceptionally lambda on it, it'll throw, but it won't get caught. Not sure if I follow you. So my assumption is if I send this request and then use exceptionally, yep. then it will work completely asynchronously. And if it has any problems, any exception, it will invoke this callback. Yeah, and then when it throws in that callback, the execution of this handler is wrapped with a try-catch exception in the executor. Will that executor try-catch still catch that runtime exception? No. Because that should the... already leave the code. Yeah. And, and the compiler wouldn't check this stuff. Well, wait, there's one important thing here. Uh, I think I know what's the problem. This might be. Uh, you know what? Um, oh, yeah. Not sure, but let me double check that.
Okay, this client is in Java 8. Yeah, that's okay. Work. I thought it could be just a project setup thing because I had the it's not another client. I think it's Java 8. It's this. this is already in the logic, yeah. I mean, let me do something different here just to see if we could fix this if I have like a private. If I just implement this with a normal method and pass it in as a method handle, that should implement the interface as well. Be cool if Eclipse then has an inline function feature of some sort. So now it's this on error. It does need to be static. I am in a static context, so then. I need to probably put my class name in front. This is that means. Application on Let me just check which of those it needs. The return type is complete job response. CB client API complete job response. That's the one we need. CB client API. But it's a uh, Java future. You're trying it yourself? I'm um, having a look. Exceptionally here, yeah? What does it say? Using the exceptionally method. Let's have a look for an example. Yeah. Oh. No, okay. Well, that's weird. So you just do ex exception lambda. That's it. So you just get rid of everything there and just do exception lambda. So it only gets called on the not exception. Sure. I'm not sure. Like just delete, it. E delete everything in the signature here, all the parameters and everything, and just write exception Ta-da. And that's your parameter. Oh, so see. exceptionally only gets called on, on the exception. And it takes one parameter, which is the exception. Oh, is it just wrapped again? Yeah, like A. Yeah, if you put throwable in there, it'll work. Ta-da. So it's like a promise reject. But why does it tell me that the function needs two parameters? That's so weird. Maybe I just fucked it up and should have just said something like this. No. Nah. Okay, nah. whatever. Eclipse Works. looks like it looks like Eclipse 
Hit type hinting is wrong. <laughs> Takes a function with a throwable, and so this looks to me like a two parameter function. Maybe I'm reading this wrong, but no, it says if you have a look at it, if you mouse over function, it says it takes one argument, represents a function that accepts one argument and produces a result. Ah, oh, damn it! That's the return type. I'm so stupid. Yeah, I'm sorry. This this is the return type of the function. If you would want to return something. Yeah. So function. Okay. Yeah. Right here. Take, yeah. There you go. The first parameter there is the. Yeah, the an optional return value. I'm so, oh, okay. No, because you're throwing in there, it, it doesn't expect you to return a return value. Uh, no, I, I, hmm, no, no, in the compiler, I, like if you tried to do anything else in the compiler except throw runtime, it would complain you didn't have a return type. Okay. So whatever happens, we take the throwable, throw it in a runtime exception. That way it gets visible, or obviously we could also be polite citizens and do some logging of some sort, but um, well, this code is pretty, pretty much not doing anything here. Garage code. Well, exactly. It's just printing. So that's okay. Awesome. We throw this uh, the stack it will show up somewhere. Yeah, Zegwood, and that will mean now we are not blocking on the completion here, which sounds like it could be a quick thing if you do your two hundred millisecond rest call. Then completion is not that long. Nevertheless, um, ZB takes some milliseconds to process that. And depending on the load, this can increase. If you have high throughput in the system, this could in even the, take. Uh, if the if the worker, seconds. if the worker is the bottleneck, right? Uh, all right. Um, should we start to wrap it up? Yeah, let's do that. It's a good solid three hours. Yeah. Uh, we could probably cut out hard the last half hour, um, me not being able to implement this Lambda correctly, but. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's cool. People will watch it and go like, gee, if this guy codes like that, like I, there's, there's, a, there's a future for me in coding. <laughs> that's me yeah. most of the time. I'm like, I have no idea how to do this. I'm gonna go uh, look at uh, Stack Overflow. <laughs> Yeah. Like even for oh. basic things like array splice the other day, I was looking up array splice to try and figure out how to implement a queue. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, that's how coding looks like today anyway, right? In fact, I think it's also how we are, uh, like when we hire people at Comunda, this is usually, they we give people jobs that they have never done before. And we rather look how they research and fix the problem or figure it out than what they have like in memory. We don't expect anybody in a coding challenge to just write, type it down. Who does that? Mm. Whiteboard coding session with no access to internet. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's not the right thing. Uh, the, the, you know. And well, we didn't, we were a little slow, but we figured it out. <laughs> but most importantly, we got a great variable name. Oh, yes. That was another half an hour that we could have spared people, but uh, it sounds good. Now we only need to finish that pull request to bring that in, right? Yeah. Let's do it. Ha. Come on, that could be. Let's let's look ten minutes into this to see how hard it gets. Doing the pull request. Yeah, and I think I need to quickly double check my calendar. Yeah. What do you got on next? Yeah, uh, it's good. Uh, some time. Okay. Um, or do we do a gateway detour? <sighs> uh, I'm not going to be able to stick around for that. 
okay. I got an, I got I got another task I got to get completed today. Yeah, me and too. it's it's now seven thirty. So anywhere, well, first we did rename. We'll save uh, save that for the next one, the gateway. Uh, yeah. The gateway deep dive. Yeah, I nailed it with the um, virtual camera. It's not using hardly any CPU now. That was the problem was I was using the green screen in StreamYard. I should use the green screen in my virtual camera. Because mm. then the camera hardware does it? Well, or... the program that's streaming the camera, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting does it more efficiently. I think it's written in C++ versus JavaScript <laughs> or, web, <laughs> yeah. or WebAssembly or whatever the browser is doing it in. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. Okay, so we kind of, well, we had this one here, max jobs to activate, and we wanted to, here, here, this was, right? This thing, run a trace. I mean, that green screen processing is like, the obvious candidate for WebAssembly, am I right? Yeah, probably. I downloaded the Twitch broadcaster uh, the other day. Not sure what that one can do, but the StreamYard seems pretty good, hey? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Look, here it is. Here it comes. This is the definitive conclusion. <laughs> the high point of the stream. Variable naming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now finally putting it into action. So um, activation threshold. So I'm going to first rename this beauty here. Thanks, Ash. Glad you enjoyed it. And thank you for your contribution to it. You've made the world a better place through open source. It's about to get pushed into master. Well, at least PR'd in. So now this one is indeed minimum jobs active because, uh, yeah, damn it. Too many questions um, because this is the absolute number and then um, here where we calculate that absolute number this is where the ratio would go in so yeah why don't we do this then we'll put yeah put the ratio in there and at least hard code it as a constant for now but name yeah. it at least and then we can expose it to users later oh, wait, I, I probably want to have this as a property Private static final, hey? Integer, no float. Well, no, this has to be a float because it's a ratio, right? It's a decimal number. Extract to constant. No, constant is too aggressive. No, nah, constant is good. No. Because it's not mutable yet, right? Yeah, well, I, I I would like to go uh, and make this, uh, expose this to the to the configuration. The users. Yeah, do you yeah. want to do you want to do the exposing to the configuration now? No, would like to have a look into it. Maybe it shouldn't be that hard, right? It's just another parameter. Yeah. Um, similar to the max jobs active. Okay, so we'll have to trace back how it's all injected then. Yeah. So well, first, the job working. Just local variable constant method. I want a field. <laughs> That's weird. Well, let's just first do a local variable. So this is the min oh, gg thread. 
Let's just copy paste. Not that anybody starts a variable discussion again. <laughs> On second thoughts, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, and now we can fail. And What's the difference between making it a final and making it a constant? Well, a constant is static for the entire class, whereas okay. an instance, uh, a final is an instance constant, so to say. I see. So you could assign some other variable to it there per instance. Yeah. So let's put this in front, make that match. Uh, I cannot. I can't. Well, you, you just need to pass it in through the uh, constructor, well, then, don't you? Add, 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 it. add it to the end of the constructor. Yeah, I probably need to change that. So that means. Um, Mega actually. constructor. Yeah, indeed, we could just add it to the constructor here. Yeah, add yeah. it at the end, right? Keep that here. No, I will not add it at the end. I will make, make it break my code. Really? I mean, this is an implementation class, right? Yeah. And the cool thing about breaking this code is now that it will tell me where else I need to look. This is, I mean, it's not a client facing API. Right? So this is by definition sure. an impl class. So nobody should be having any dependencies to it. Um, yeah. No, this uh, is. Yeah. If you added it on the end and there was a missing parameter, when it was in when it was constructed, does that throw in Java or can you have missing parameters? We don't have to save it because it's only used in the constructor anyway. So we can get rid of that stuff. Boom. Here. And that's final. It gets added here and that's it. Um now there we go. Now the worker builder explodes because it doesn't match the signature anymore. And now uh, there. Um, so where is Max Jobs Active coming from? So you need to do ensure not null. Interesting. This is even coming in here as a parameter. What happens if you? What happens if you click on job type and say go to definition or something? Open. Open is coming in from the builder. And then probably the builder sets this here. Next jobs active. It's interesting that you set it individually here. But okay. Okay, there comes the default value. We want to expose it to the worker API. No, yeah, I guess if we start with it, then we, we have to create one of those. Yeah, let's go all the way. Let's do it. So you have to do a get default min jobs active. Mm, yep, yeah, exactly. First of all, here we are. Back in a tick. Oops. 
doesn't exactly look like a ah. okay wait first let's create duty here create field uh -huh. yeah that's good So it has two ways to configure it. One is through the builder, and in addition, also through the defaults. Well, I'm wondering whether this could even be. Oh no, the ensure util doesn't have a. Oh, it does it. Do you need to implement a class to deal with floats, huh? Yeah, I have to do it with floats. On the other hand, it might even be, be allowable to say um, zero on this ratio. So that would lead to your behavior that you had on Friday, where you start acquisition even if a single job is, is missing. Isn't that 100 or one? Yeah, that would be one. That would be one. Or point zero point nine zero point nine nine. Because mm -hmm. it's when so it drops when it drops below that threshold, it'll activate more jobs. So that's like point nine 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 yeah, okay. nine Got nine. It. The logic is is the other way around. Um, so indeed, then it means uh, if you go zero you disable job acquisition which doesn't make sense yeah exactly so it's got to be greater than zero okay so looks like then i do like this create a breaker then ash is learning java by osmosis <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I learned it by reverse engineering, mostly in Minecraft, and then after that in ZB. But all the, I mean, all programming, I mean, until you get into some esoteric languages like um, Forth or, what's that other one that's really, everyone's always going on about? Um, Idris, Idris. Can I somehow implement this without having two copies of the method? Because the, the logic is exactly the same, right? 
It's just different types. Well, if you want to go hardcore, you just say ensure um, ensure min jobs active is valid, and then just implement the whole condition in one single predicate. Oh, this is kind of just wondering. I mean, that that requires probably some more Java logic. But well, long and float are different beasts. So if you want to do comparisons, and then you you convert into a long, for example, no, you flo you could convert the long into a float, but then. Or a double that probably needs to be, but then you lose precision. So let's not screw things up. Um, safe. Um, yeah. <sighs> I'm chewing gum to pretend that I'm eating, <laughs> and then I'm taking these diuretics, so I have to keep going to the bathroom every couple of minutes. My comp contest preparation. Oh, yeah. Uh, to final everything. Should break the van. It's a problem now. Oh, public would be good. Wait, now that works. Um, and now we need to go and implement this beauty. Quick fix. Create method. No, oh, this is even called different. Maybe I should also add that then. Job worker. It does make sense to give it some context. And I think I'll go with flows to the other parameter because they definitely belong together. So now I have to ask break again. Job worker. Yeah, here we are in the context of the job worker, so it's obvious what we're talking about, more or less, hopefully, by our variable name. Interesting how this is referencing for uh, here. And with a T4 job worker minute. And now ah, damn it. Oh, yeah, we need to f somehow obviously implement that. Okay. Open implementation, and this should probably have an Where did I put it? Uh, here it is. Let's see where it belongs. Probably somewhere here. I oh, know that's a setter. Here we are, get and there's a lot of boilerplate code involved in this. Yeah, that's one thing that I'm not a big fan of. I like the way Kotlin kind of like went, you know what? 
let's uh, reduce the boilerplate. Yeah, I mean, and I'm not talking about the getters and setters for properties here. I'm more wondering about, uh, you know, the client has a configuration interface and then um, yeah, that's implemented and so it's like a little bit too much for my taste, but maybe there's reasons why this is a good practice. So we want a Well, yeah, I mean, in JavaScript, you just like, yeah, whatever, YOLO, and you just program without that. But you get to a certain point of maintenance and comprehensibility for other people, and you're like, ah, oh, let me add it in, TypeScript. But even getters and setters, I wouldn't do. It's a bit hardcore. Uh, and there are libraries for Java that you can use to just Lombok. So here we need a field. I'm following the convention here that they are all called default. I think this might be historically grown that these guys are not called default. So, and mm. there goes the final value. 0 0.34. F. Okay, and now we can go the other way around and generate the getter for it. Or do we? No, I will just copy the other, the other method. Let's just see what that's used. Use defined, it's used. Well, this is hardly visible here, but there it is. Oh, this is just two strings implemented here. Well, That's the one we need to write. Um, for job worker minimum. That's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah. Me too. So this being our and probably that's also float. I think that's there's some stuff that's necessary because this may work with big files. And then some boilerplate classes to make config file parsing into objects more easy. Um, oh yeah, obviously that's here. And it looks like we are missing this in the super type. Super type. Now let's quickly look. This is all the way. Specified in ZB client builder. Okay. And this thing needs to be also in ZB client builder. Actually, that name shouldn't that name be okay yeah okay yeah you do it on the client right and then you can set it again specifically for the worker instance so this actually 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, this was the missing method that I was referencing already in the in the source code comment in the other implementation. Yeah. What was it? Oh, I lost it. Anyway, let's go here. Let's just see how it should look like. Parameter min jobs active ratio. There you are. No, okay, it still has. Oh, no. Now we need to also do the workflow builder step. <laughs> yes. And there's this one. This one is like in order, right? Like, that's the thing I don't like about the builder pattern because it looks like a fluent API, but it's like they have to be in a specific order. Yeah. And that is a way to enforce certain mandatory things in a builder. So in, in that build step, you might have different options of what you can do, but we force you to do some things first. And this is a bit of a way in a fluent API that you can educate users about which things they really have to have. Or it could also be a way like, um, for example, maybe right. in the first step you have different options on which route to take. And when you start taking a route, then it gets you to another step that has some other choices. Changes. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Makes sense. Sure yeah. Because otherwise, process with different <laughs> choices and then parallel sections. Yes. Because otherwise, yeah, you can't, you can't, um, validate the object at um, design time. You can only validate it at runtime then. If it's just purely a fluent API that returns this, you can't tell in the code if the object has been completely configured or not. One put the type here? No. I think 0 0.3. Mm -hmm. For this, and this doesn't exist yet. That's OK. Now let's build it. Obviously, this has an interface. <clears throat> oh, look! This is actually having some good configuration, some some good documentation here. This is great. The default values are relatively quick in the explanation, but this is really great box here. I like that. Problem is. I'm not sure if max or max jobs active is frequently set. So people yeah. so. Well, you can't set min job active mm -hmm. ratio without setting max jobs active, right? Or to put it another way, you're unlikely to set it and unless you set this. Just adjust this one here. Mm. This actually will break people's code. This will be a breaking change. Well, it's not because it returns builder step three, so it's an optional, um, an optional step at the same stage. Oh, okay. This is um, just an additional feature. It doesn't break anything. Mm. But yeah, thanks for keeping an eye on it. I'll keep me saying here. The builder for this worker. That will be important now in the implementation of it. We return the, uh, this and be safe. So I okay, can give some feedback here. I think this is a good place to copy our, our Java doc. Length. Set the mm 
No, it's not the number. You could say the minimum percentage as a ratio. For example, 0 0.3 equals 30%. So yeah, it, it configures the minimum number of jobs. Yeah, as a uh, ratio. In, as a ratio. Or do I say it's a ratio that depends on the maximum jobs active? Right? If I need to say in what is it in what is it in relation to? In relation to the max active jobs. Ratio. As so it's just all as right. Is that right? Thank you. The right grammar. Mm. Ratio of next yeah, active. yeah. You could give an example. For mm -hmm. example, I, I noticed that people reason better from examples. You know, like when you are looking at that abstract, you know, formal definition of the function interface i found someone's written some code and looked at it and went like oh you just put exception in there <laughs> it was easier to work backwards from an example mm. Man, YouTube music has thrown out some good jams for me. StreamYard should have that streaming to both of us. And potential. Well, I mean, I, you can probably stream it to the stream as well, right? Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I had before, but Burnt was like, I can't handle watching it with the music. Can you turn the music off? <laughs> yeah, and then, then like, we okay. need the backstage. We need the... The backstage music just for us yeah for yeah us. okay yeah, or, it, uh, I do that. or twitch just needs to have an extra knob for the music background music on and off right oh uh, yes that would be perfect because <laughs> I, I actually got a streaming license from monster cat so i can stream monster cat music on twitch for free it's five mm -hmm. bucks a month Let's have a look. Twitch background music. Is there a way to do that? You know what some of the most popular channels on Twitch are for coding? Coding Twitch integrations. Uh -huh. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> I did that once. I, I, I coded a Twitch integration live on Twitch. And it was, um, I would play the monstercat.com music in the web browser. And I had a web socket with a grease monkey script that would then connect to my open broadcast studio and then push the name of the song that was currently playing in and then stick it into the stream. Background music. Oh God, you got your example. Um... Maybe just make it if max jobs active is 30 in your example, because it, it's actually, mm. there we go. What should I call 10 as an example or obvious, easier to calculate. Or a hundred. You need to be careful what you write here because that gives people ideas of what could be configuration values. 
Yeah, exactly. Stick oh, close Steve to the defaults, I reckon. And that's it. I'm out of gum. Bummer. Dun dun dun. Let's do gather here. Okay. What is this complaining about? I think the updates. You better be careful with your coding style. This you, you're being watched. <laughs> yes, you're being watched and harshly judged. Yeah, but it's cool to have it in the ID already. So um, now we just need an implementation of this. Hang on a second, why is this? Oh, yeah, obviously, that's what I mean. You're being watched. Um, So yeah, that was the interface, and now some code piece should yeah there we are worker builder. Impl stage three should probably be the one. Oh yeah, here. Mm. Oh, interesting. Let's implement all three stages in a single class. And it probably casts them down to the uh, stage interfaces. Let's um, go here. This is where we are meeting, huh? There we are, min jobs active ratio already exists. And to return this. A null here would have break would have been breaking people's code. I'm afraid test cases will also wait for us to make this complete because this is obviously really important code. We better make sure that this works correctly. You know, that's how it always is. You think you have a very easy code change, but then to make a production quality code takes ah, you a day. Story of my life. Yeah. This is actually why, I mean, I've made some changes to the client and to different things, but um, yeah, I usually don't end up getting them all the way because I'm like, gosh. Mm hmm. Or I'll throw something kind of half-baked over the fence and let one of the engineers finish it. <laughs> yeah, indeed. No, but what would happen probably is if you suggest this now. I mean, it could be an option to just suggest it now, but then it stays there and you have an unfinished pull request as a draft. And... Yeah, the other way would be to open it as an option and ask for it to be done. Mm -hmm. Feature request. Yeah. That's the lightweight, that'd be the lightweight way to do it. I mean, even if you kind of have half implemented in a pull request, it's all might be even harder for someone to, to get it over the line. Or, you know, well, you know what we could do? We could stick it into, um, in as a feature request and make it a Hacktober, make it a Hacktoberfest labeled one. And then put a link to this video in it. <laughs> and then mm. someone can do it, you know? Because like they can just like sit down with Falco and like go through the first half of it and then get the rest of it over the line themselves. That'd be awesome. Or or save it up for October so we can submit it for our own t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> True story. I don't know if we'll be able to get that get it. Uh, I think it might oh no, actually it is for people inside come under as well. Yeah. True yeah, story. Can. 
And I think as a consultant, I'm, I'm kind of qualified because I'm, it's not my everyday job to write ZB code. So if I'm right. going the extra mile here, and I'm really doing that right now uh, of, of preparing a code pull request, I think that's worth rewarding. A t-shirt. Yeah. Push into a branch and then leave it until uh, October. Good thinking. But on the other hand, my closet is pretty full of Kamunda t-shirts. So, I mean, yeah, right. Oktoberfest is a bit of a collectible. But That's true. It's a one of a kind. You had to be there. And I guess partly the idea of Hacktoberfest is also that you contribute to projects that you don't usually contribute to. All right. Um, are we missing something? I have no idea. I'm a little, a little lost now. My concentration fades. I need a breakfast. I think, yeah, the mistake, if there was one, was starting the pull request at the end and thinking, this will just take a couple of minutes, right? Yeah. 10 minutes, we said. Yeah. I think it's more or less complete. I mean, at least there are no compile errors anymore. That means I have at least implemented all the interfaces and run, run the tests and then submit the PR. <laughs> oh, tests. Yeah. So I guess what I could look is, you know, we have our sister property, which is the max job max job active so I could yeah. go a little bit hey where is that used hang on a second what's that thing there's a there's a constant <laughs> oh, no that is a constant what is that for properties i bet this is really just for config files to to know what they are setting and worker and stand for config files default uh, Okay, fine. Uh huh, with properties. Oh, it really gets spoiled up lately. This will probably stick in your memory as oh, this this thing Java doesn't do very well. This is Kotlin or something. Maybe it is, but I think it's just to have some. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, whenever I have to write something from scratch these days, I use Kotlin. This is for sure all for the convenience of our users. Here we are. That's good. And here is the test. Should have default values. Okay, that sounds like a reasonable assertion to make. Default job worker in ratio is equal to zero point three. 
Okay, that would already exercise a little bit our code. And I would almost think that could be maybe a... No, that's just stuff. No, apparently there's no test config files or something that would validate that. Like we are safe, this one is only used once. Um, this thing was here. Okay, apparently there's no test case for this one, then we don't need the test case for this one. It's a bit of a pity because this has the best documentation. And for some reason, when you look at the defaults, it doesn't guide you to this step here. Or did it? Now yeah, here you see the default. And then here's like a, oh no, okay, this one did guide you to us. Okay, got it, got it, got it. I'm not complaining anymore. wasn't the case for the threads. That's what I would have in memory. And the threads, as this is not worker-specific, but shared, this is only for the client. Okay. The headbanging um, feels a little bit like a nodding of approval. It is. <laughs> Both for the soundtrack and for your pull request. <laughs> All right. You know what? Let's run the tests. Yes. So let's actually run with code coverage, should we? Yeah, let's do that. I mean, technically, we should have run the test before starting the code mutation, but whatever. Well, I would assume that the tests worked before. All right, coverage report is coming in. Let's see if some of our stuff is uncovered. Let's maybe do it the other way around. Just go back to this. Exactly, our code should now be nicely colored. This doesn't look so good. This is all stuff is not covered. But uh, I, I see the point. It's difficult to test this without having a real broker. Yeah. On the other hand, at least the startup of this should be testable. I wrote tests for mine that are uh, integration tests. So you have to actually have a running broker to test it. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that could exist as well. I don't know. I can check that. Integration tests. Okay, let's see this one here. Okay, well, we're not doing better than the other method there. Okay, that's good. Uh, as long as we're in the neighborhood. Yeah. An interesting would be really... This, this is a pity that this code is not covered at all. Good test. This be accessible. No, no, it's difficult. But hey, essentially, all we did was just
Yeah, I guess you don't get that far that you build a client and you can start a worker without having a connection to the broker. That's the problem. You need yes. some kind of big broker, or maybe you have to start a broker in order to get it done. Test containers. There, there, there's test containers for it. Mm. Is there any integration test in here? I actually started building a mock, uh, a, a broker mock, <laughs> using it using a gRPC uh, server. Yeah, our testing game is a totally different session. Okay, I think this looks uh, good enough for me. Now I need to just wrap this up. I mean, I can do this offline to just submit it. Oh, now let's do that part because, I mean, now this last part of this uh, session becomes a standalone video for Hacktoberfest, how to do a PR. <laughs> okay. Um, so have, you got time, me... have you got time for it? No, should only take, sure. you know, a couple of minutes. No, it's okay. Or no, wait. Um, no, actually. You I have should. a meeting at, at, yeah. at 30 past. You still got to have breakfast as well. Yeah. Okay. I give it eight minutes. If it's not done by then, screw okay. it. And for making that possible, I will leave Eclipse and just do it in command line a proper shell. So let's go get ZB. That's where we were. Let's see if I have my remote set up correctly. Um, yes, I do. That's good. So then currently are on the develop branch and we have all sorts of changes. Are you and up to date? When's the last time you pulled from develop? I did that right before we started the, the work on the code. So Boom. that should be, I mean, okay. I could actually just get pull again. Key, Super secure. Yeah. Um, and I'm up to date. And there were no more merge conflicts because apparently nobody worked on the, on the client. Yeah, and, it's pretty right. stable these days. So now, yeah, I think this is actually a good tutorial to see what we need to do. So we need to create a new branch. Get check out. Mm -hmm. e. And how should we call this? Obviously, we use our variable name, right? Um, I'll probably I should, should put Java client in active in jobs. I'm not sure. Great. So now we have a branch. This is now just a local branch in my local uh, repository. And my plan will be that I um, push this branch to uh, my fork at GitHub. So that's why I checked the remotes earlier. Um, so I have the ZB origin. That's my uh, that's the official ZB repository on GitHub. And then I have an own fork of it. Uh, slash Falco is my um, GitHub username. And that's where I would want to push that change. Um, first, we will uh, commit the changes to this branch. And I'm using a little tool called git cola. And just uh, double check a little bit that I didn't do any stupidity here. Or actually, would it be good to run? Yeah, I think we should do one thing before. Um, Java to just a Maven clean for the install. And this power find. Um, that would be some last safety check. And also there are some tools integrated in Maven that will take care of code formatting and certain validations. Linting. Uh, I think they are also um, in Eclipse. So that's why I already got punished for a couple of white space mistakes that I had in the code. Okay. Oh, sorry. My docs just joined me and they're making some weird background noise. Yeah, cool. 
<laughs> vomiting a hairball onto the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> no. Aha. Uh -huh. You see what's wrong here? Mm -hmm. It's not in the interface. That's interesting. Is this some kind of PC break check that is kicking in here? What is this doing? I mean, the, the, oh, sorry for the German here. So this is telling me, yes, in ZB client builder, there was a new method default Blah, blah, blah. Um, that was added to the interface, which is true. So I'm not sure if why this would be an error here. Yeah, and you see this here is a clear Maven plugin. What's this beauty doing? Maybe that's just supposed to fail because I did do a BC, well, not really a BC break. I mean, I, I did something. Compare binaries and sources for compatibility. That's what I thought. So kind of BC break check. But is it really a problem that I do this? I don't know. You know what? Let's submit it anyway and then discuss this thing with the, the engineers. So okay. back to Bitcoin. <clears throat> Polo is only available on Linux, as far as I'm aware. And I really like it because it's a, like before I commit, I do that as a last minute check. Hang on a second. This looks looks weird. I think I made a copy paste mistake here, right? You see this? There I changed the parameter name of the other method. That's what's gone wrong. No, that was just Java doc. I don't think that that was detectable by this other okay. tool. Um, let's check that again. This is client builder. CB client configuration client builder Java. Oh, here it did have some coverage. I think it was the no, that's the implementation. We need the interface. Interface is here. Yep, I totally screwed up that one. This one is correct. So I think it's fine. Right. I don't know. We added a new method. Yeah, we added a new constant. Um, new method data types seem to match. Names look correct. Um, here we have the new method on the builder step. And that's the builder step interface. Ooh. It's interesting. This is the builder step one interface. Should this be on the builder step one interface? I don't know. So here's just all implemented and then where were the steps defined? Step. 
confused. Job worker build a step. Oh, you can override it on the job worker builder. Okay. Wow. Well. Okay, it's basically step one. So this is what I meant earlier. The first step requires you to have the job type because without a job type, nothing makes sense. And then build a step two. Handler. Is, is the handler because that's also mandatory. And step three is then all the rest. Okay, uh, optional. Including open. Yeah, and those are all optional. You don't have to put them, right? Okay. But any of them will return you the same builder step until you call open, which starts the worker. Cool. So I think that's pretty reasonable. And I think that's something where, where that we debated to kind of force the number of threads to be exposed a little bit earlier here in a client builder or something like that. Well, in the worker, you don't have that anyway because the thread pool is shared. Maybe that's the reason why the threads is a little bit hidden because it's a shared thread pool and therefore you don't see it when you build your worker. Mm. So it could be that we also make our client examples a little bit better. Uh, we've gone over the eight minutes. Uh, I see that. Let me just quickly go through this if this makes roughly sense. Um, mm -hmm. You want to keep going? Yeah. We're almost there. So we need okay. a new helper. It's fine. Um, we have our float here. Float step. And I did a bit of refactoring here. Or maybe that, no, that was also the code. Um, that's what happens when you run Maven. It refactors uh, and reformats. Uh, uh, and here, this was the real implementation change, or not so much. I mean, we just had kept the same formula. We changed the variable name here, and we introduced our parameter here. Uh, and then we use it here for the comparison. What that was done using if refactoring in Eclipse, so it's kind of hard to mess that up. Cool. Uh, all that stuff is just other toys that I was playing with. Um, oh, look at this. This context menu is in German, and then other things are in Spanish in the same way. Uh -huh. Epic. <laughs> My machine is really messed up. So what is this now? Uh, interesting thing for... For ZB commits, you will want to stick to um, certain commit guidelines. Back. I think that should be outlined here and contributing. That's the right here. I think I roughly remember it. So we want um, uh, lock in Git to be relatively easy to read. So there's a certain guideline of how a commit message needs to look like. And in our case, we want to do commit. Feature in Again, in 
Jobs Active Ratio. Could work. So now the app is committed locally. And now the important point, we push it to a fork. Just to recap again, right? I have two remotes here. Falco is my own fork at GitHub. And then I can push there, which will create that branch. And then uh, there's a really nice thing. Here, it immediately gives me the URL that I need to use in order to create that as a pull request. So I'll just um, copy that and go to the browser here. Yeah, and it already pre-fills it. So you can see here, this is on my repository, it goes to ZB and uh, it's already pre-filled with my commit message and can also now uh, has the template for the bit wing. I think I'll look a little bit sloppy here. Um, There are no related issues. Um, definition of done. Changes are backwards compatible. Yes, um, it fixes a bug. Um, no, doesn't fix a bug. Do I have to then? Not. I will remove that. applicable really well technically in the way house is built i'm not meeting the condition so the the outcome is still true <laughs> um, they are testing um yes, okay hmm. no not really i guess that's no <laughs> Changes verified by a benchmark? No. Documentation is updated. Uh, partially, we have. Uh, yeah, Javadoc. Javadoc. Well, yeah, the documentation hasn't been updated, but yeah. Is that stuff in the docs? No, nah, it's not going to be in the docs because it was hard coded internally it was invisible yeah but then just... for example for the clients the java client uh no. a setup let's say it that way if we find max jobs active in here we have work to do if, and i don't see that happening Yeah. Next jobs to activate, but well, that is just a client thing. I think we're safe on that side. I think so. It's a, it's a future task to be done. To do. Um, well, yeah, it's uh, not really documented in there, but uh, I yeah yeah. I mean, it's an advanced parameter. It defaults to zero point three, right? Well, the Java doc is updated. And yeah. uh, well, the default value is the same. And 
And yeah, I think that's just maybe that's something we can uh, say. It's a default value. Art code is kept changes. Okay, that was probably a thing that this thing was used both in the client builder as a default and also in the job worker builder. And you can, when you build a client, you can override the default for all your job workers, or you can also build an individual job worker that has a different ratio there, depending on what your job type needs. I think this is good to go on create pull request. Took a little bit longer than 10 minutes. Yep. <laughs> the whole thing, <laughs> like more like an hour. Yeah, but hey, I mean, this is probably this is good pure. This is pure quality. Yeah, I mean, it's a relatively easy change. It's really just exposing something as a configuration. Um, it might bring up the question whether we want to expose that, and now we have to kind of these public API features we have to maintain forever if we decide so. So probably needs some discussion. But hey, yeah. uh, having that hard coded is probably not helpful in case you have a workload that doesn't really work so good with that particular setting. All right, fifteen awesome. minutes. Until so let's then okay time for breakfast have a quick breakfast or you probably have some dinner yeah i'm gonna do that and good hanging out with you and coding brother it's yeah, awesome definitely. making it's the world a bit more expected but uh, we can see if we uh, get the gateway session going one of the next days i would really like to review the gateway part and understand that in detail yeah okay let's do it later this week Mm -hmm. Spelling, there's a spelling error there. Feature clients, Java. You got clients. <sighs> yes, it'll be good. We'll use this. I'll use this for Hacktoberfest. How to do a pull request. So good. in that case, um, let me do a git commit minus amend. This is even a good thing. You can see it well. Because that was my commit message that I messed up. Yeah. So I'm just gonna hit push for at least. Wait, that isn't so good. Uh, I go with force. Usually, it should set up the local branch as a. As following the other project. It's tracking it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, um, from here. Oh, uh, yeah. Now it's telling Set me up that stream. Have... In, the, in the ZB documentation, it recommends that if you do have to do a git emit, uh, git commit amend, that you use force least, which means you got to do it before anyone else pushes. Again, 
Uh, ah, yeah. for, for the git commit amend, they recommend that you use git push force double double yeah uh, double minus force dash lease. No, it's uh, it's one word. Yeah, force dash lease. Okay. Yeah, like that, and that just makes sure that you don't push over the top of someone else's commit that happened in the meantime. That's good. An, it's it's lease with an e, not leased, but lease like lend lease. So the last T, no, you had it right. It's L-E-A-S-E, -E, force lease, like that. Uh, maybe it's force, maybe it's force with lease then. Let me Google it. Oh uh, yeah, force with, force with lease. Yeah, force with lease. That's it there. And that just means that if there's been another git push to that uh, branch before you did this, it won't do it. Because if you just do double minus force, you'll overwrite anything else that happened after that. Yeah, indeed. That way you don't break people's things. And then you run into this problem that people have local copies that are deviating. That totally yeah. makes sense. Thanks for that. That's, that will go in my show magic. Awesome. OK. So Enjoy the rest of your day, my friend. Just want to check. I guess it should now also show here. I forced push to that, and then all the checks will probably rerun again. Yes. Winning. Cool. Wrapping it up. Awesome. OK, uh, yeah, let's get some time later this week, and we'll go deep into the ZB gateway. Yeah, let's do that. Then have a great evening. OK. Will do. Love your work. See you soon. Bye then.